we have on the line? I'm Brendan James, and the only thing going on on this podcast is a lot of male bonding. <laughs> it's true, and this week's episode is Bart the Murderer. I don't know how to break this to you, but Principal Skinner is missing. <laughs> <laughs> uh oh. This week's episode originally aired on October 10th, 1991, and as always, Henry will tell us what happened on this mythical day in real world history. (gasps) Oh my god! Oh boy, Bobby, both Anita Hill and Clarence Thomas are interviewed in the Capitol. Red Fox passes away on the set of his TV show, The Royal Family, and The Fisher King is number one at the box office. Red Fox famously passing away from a heart attack when that was his shtick. Yes, yeah, it's uh, it's a classic Hollywood story that he's he's on the show. No one remembers the show. It's the, the royal family is only known as the show Red Fox died on, but it was during the first season of it. Uh, he has a heart attack, as famously known Red Fox's bit in Sanford and Son was that he always pretended, he'd be like, I'm coming, Elizabeth. That was his whole shtick. And people, if you do that your entire career and you you eventually do have a heart attack people will think you're joking and uh I, w- I would bet if they didn't think he was joking he probably wouldn't have survived it anyway mm-hmm, but yeah. it's just it's a it's a uh a, a kind of uh tragic comic ending to to the life of a very famous comedian and the show was on fox it was on the, the same network as as simpsons as well uh, it wasn't part of the simpsons drexel's class block uh, mm-hmm. i think rock snuck in there too at the end yes yeah drexel class rock said they the, you know, it Did was, you say Drexel's class rocks, Henry? <laughs> I don't think so. No, I don't. I, I disagree with that. And yes, the the whole the Clarence Thomas thing still going on. I think uh, in between air dates of this episode and the next one, Clarence Thomas is confirmed. And uh, boy, he's still he's still having fun <laughs> to this day in, in the old Supreme Court. That guy. You know, it really brought the uh, the topic of sexual harassment into pop culture. And there's been a lot of bad sitcom episodes based on that topic around this yeah, time. Yeah, Sim- and the Simpsons will do one. The Simpsons will do one. Homer Badman is a really great episode, except for in all the ways it gets uh, sexual harassment entirely wrong. Yeah, like uh, in, in other, in in so many other ways, it's great. Uh, but the the Homer Badman stance that a woman misunderstands something and thus she is wrong and needs to be told by a man that like you just misunderstood <laughs> what I did, like. Yeah, yeah. Give so harassers the benefit of the doubt. It exactly. could be a fun what, joke, Brendan. Was that um was that a direct response to the Clarence Thomas stuff that episode? Well, it was just that uh, I I see it as uh, not directly to that, but I mean the Clarence Thomas thing catapulted even more discussion of sexual harassment in the workplace, and so yeah, there were. Uh, I mean, it, it just brought the idea into the world. I remember the the famous PSA that's sexual harassment, and I don't have to take it. Yeah, that's, a classic. That's a mystery sign theater uh recurring line absolutely <laughs> i mean it was yeah. hilarious uh-huh. a woman being harassed this woman is yeah. standing up for herself what a comedic Listen, concept when we stopped laughing at the old woman falling down we had to laugh at another commercial <laughs> and that was the next one <laughs> and yeah the fisher king it rules i love that movie you know it's so great like i mean robin williams is just so great in it and it's you know it sadly i think his his character who is suffering from you know mental illness and and uh, it, it hurts more watching it now after after yeah. his passing, I think. But uh, also, sadly, um, I, I love that movie too. But I think of it a lot because it's an example of an Oscar curse for Mercedes Rule, who I believe won the Oscar for Best Supporting Actress in that film, right. and she never really w- like was in anything again. I think the most hmm. high-profile thing she was in was uh, Frasier for season three. She was Frasier's uh, love interest in a kind of the weakest part of season three. Right. Uh, right. Uh, so, you know, the likes of Kubo Gooding Jr. and Adrian Brody, and I, I put Mercedes Rule in there. Fisher King. I'd say Halle Berry as well, too. Yeah, she's. Oh, yeah, classic. Halle Berry, yeah. yeah. But, uh, well, and also the actor, uh, I, I should just look up his name, but the the uh, the drag queen homeless guy in it, he is the greatest. Like, I love him. His The song he sings of that is so great. Like, he is just a funny, funny guy. He was, and then he went on Evening Shade, the uh, the Burt Reynolds series. Speaking of Frasier, I didn't know David Hyde Pierce was in this movie. Oh, right. I, I haven't yeah. seen it. I'm he's sorry. the scumbag. He's the scumbag 
like agent for Jeff Bridges's character. Yeah, um, I completely forgot about that. So that's two Frasier connections. <laughs> what right. what else is in that movie? I wonder. Uh, oh, and Michael Jeter is the actor I'm thinking of, and and he's great. By the way, man, the cast of Evening Shade: uh, Ossie Davis, Hal Holbrook, Michael Jeter, Charles Ooh. Durning. What a cast! Man, Mary Lou Henner and Widgeworth. Like, yeah, boy, Evening Shade. We should be doing a podcast <laughs> on Evening Shade here. I don't want to turn this into too much of a rolling um, uh, <laughs> reference fest, but Hal Holbrook also uh, famously, well, not famously, maybe, but in The Sopranos in season six, there's a Hal Holbrook cameo, which connects to the episode where kind of connects to the episode we're talking about today. That's right. Yeah, man. I Well, yeah, this uh, there there wouldn't just like this episode of Simpsons, I don't think would exist without Martin Scorsese's Goodfellas. There wouldn't be a Sopranos at all without mm-hmm. Martin Scorsese's yes. Goodfellas. Now, that's my first question, actually. Actually, um, because th- this is good that I have questions because, you know, last time it was my first time on with you guys and I was so negative because it was a season 12 episode or whatever. And I, you know, I kind of had to lighten up a bit and I got more into the flow. But this time I have an equal and opposite problem because this is just a wonderful classic episode. Mm-hmm. And I don't know if I have anything to say <laughs> how much I love the jokes and it's very funny. But I have a question first, which is uh, I didn't do a ton of research. I, I did listen to the commentary because I have the DVDs. You know, a lot of this is very Goodfellas, but I think someone says on the commentary they wrote it before Goodfellas came out or before they even saw Goodfellas. Was this released before Goodfellas or or, or after it or at the same time exactly? I also listened to the commentary and I think that was Al Jean being tongue in cheek. I like, think Al Jean's oh, full of crap okay. there. Joking, yeah. you know, it was him joking about like, oh could they sue us or whatever i don't yeah. think he was trying to claim that they invented goodfellas or anything yeah. but goodfellas came out in 90 yeah right so September 90 so 13 months before this episode the perfect amount of time to produce right. an episode of the simpsons and what's interesting about this is this was definitely written like a few months after the movie came out and it's interesting to see that they didn't jump on the same memes everyone else did like it's astounding mm-hmm. that in this episode that there is no joe pesci style character yeah uh, dan castellanetta is doing joe pesci's voice for for uh, Louie, but uh, there is no, like, am I a clown? Do I amuse you? Like, everyone jumped on that. There was a right. Animaniac sketch based on that. That was what so uh, many. <laughs> Jim Brewer's Joe Pesci character did on SNL. Like, it's funny to see what they uh, jumped on in this. And one of them is lampooning a guy in the movie who no one really caric- caricatures, and that's um, Paul Cicero. Mm-hmm, like, that's, mm-hmm. that's yes. Fat Tony. Yeah. Uh, although I will say, apparently, from listening to the commentary, there is a character, he's a mainstay in the in the mob you know into fat tony's gang after this episode he's got the kind of big curly hair he looks to me i always thought that was a goodfellas character they were doing i think his name is carmine in the movie oh yes we got a story <laughs> we got a story okay on that. okay because yeah. they said in the commentary that was supposed to look like joe pesci and to me and i think a lot of people it doesn't really look like joe pesci it looks like that guy from goodfellas with the big hair absolutely I, I don't know if that if that was a misremembered uh, anecdote no no really no meant the other guy. Yeah, crap. Okay. But, but we we should properly yes. <laughs> introduce our guest here. Yeah, joining oh, us yeah. once again is Brendan James of the Blowback Podcast. And Brendan, don't feel bad about being slightly negative on your first appearance because everyone needs to go through their modern Simpsons therapy with us first mm-hmm. as a first yes. time guest. Everybody does it, it was, and we're cool with it. It was primal scream uh, therapy <laughs> that I'm opened up now. I, I Everything's out. I'm at peace. I think the next season of Blowback is, well, it's been announced at the time of this recording. It's it's coming soon. And I mean, the, the Cuba season and all the, the extras were great. Uh, I thank you. It's it's unfortunate how current events sometimes line up with the releases of your your podcast. I'm a little worried about this season three. <laughs> I gotta say. Well, I I think uh, you know this will probably be the season where where we jump the shark. This is our this will be our season uh, ten nine, the end of the golden era, <laughs> much like The Simpsons. We we had you know I, I I was snarky last time, but it's hard to make something good for that long. So maybe I should watch what I say. Um, <laughs> no, we're excited for season three, and yes, I think by the time this comes out. We'll still be working on it. We we have uh, more ambitions this season. Uh, I don't want to hype it up too much, but it's going to take a little longer. But uh, hopefully, it's worth it. And it's about the Korean War. And if you liked seasons one or two, or if you've never heard of the show, by all means, uh, stay tuned for season three. I, I said it last time, but but season one is especially a great listen at a time when people talk about what defines a war crime and what invasions are. I think it's a good good mm-hmm. time to listen to listen back to blowback season one. I think I I hate that this is the thing we make and enjoy doing is uh tied up in so many negative emotions for people and <laughs> real world negative things but i guess you just 
play the cards you're dealt. Hey, you're you're great at it, Brandon. You you, you and Noah thank are you. are great. Are great. Yeah, thank but... you, thank you. But I, I'm I have to say it's nice to take a break and simply pod about The Simpsons and Fat Tony right mm. now. Well, and how, what do you feel about mafia movies? Are you a big mafia movie fanboy? A mafia television? I mean, I know uh, you love The Sopranos. Yes, I was just on uh, another show uh, called Pod Yourself a Gun, which uh, is a fun uh, fun show about The Sopranos. I think that's what gave us the idea to, to do this one with you guys. And yeah, I, I don't know if I'm an encyclopedic, but I've seen a lot of gangster movies. I, I love the genre. I get a lot of the gags that I think the real heads are supposed to get in this episode, for example. <laughs> and yeah, uh, I was actually going to say uh, Joe Montaigne's, uh, w- one of his earlier movies, maybe we can talk about him in a little bit, but House of Games is a really, that st- stars him. It's a David Mamet movie. It's one of my favorite uh, gangster movies, or at least, you know, criminal kind of con artist movies. And it actually stars Joe Montaigne. So this is a, a good intersection uh, as an episode to a lot of stuff. Yeah, you know, uh, but, but Brandon, have you ever considered that mafia movies could be like a metaphor for like <laughs> America. Uh, I gotta stop production on season three right now and consider this heavily. Uh, yeah, we we used a lot of um, Sopranos clips, particularly in season one of Blowback, because sometimes th- there's just nothing better than to let Polly Walnuts articulate something that you know doesn't need to be spelled out uh, in in real terms. One one of my favorite bits, and I I just did a full rewatch of Sopranos, and as much as Simpsons, it is so of its time, and I just love like just little moments like when tony is on a vacation and he's watching just some random tv show that that says well terrorists could come in through the ports and that would be bad then later in the episode he's like and i had this story about they caught a bunch of terrorists at the ports and and one of his friends says like well thank god they caught him right (laughs) but yeah that's like (laughs) no i but i think to your point it's it's of its time in the best way possible, uh, you know, like like the Golden Era Simpsons is, because it. I think it's quite impressive how much distance they they seem to have when writing all, especially the War on Terror stuff. It really doesn't plug into anything that they, they weren't drinking the Kool Aid. You know, it was pretty pretty dispassionate and um, well written from from the moment that season three goes into the 9-11 stuff and i think it stands up quite well re-watching it especially mm-hmm. because that uh, that subculture that italian american subculture of the mafia was a really fascinating group to look at during that time because they were uber patriotic and had always been uber patriotic despite their daily grind and every single cent that they ever made coming from uh, being on the run from the government, trying to defraud the government, possibly killing people related or working for the government. That was like compartmentalized in a way. And I think there's an episode where Christopher says uh, after 9-11, you know, listen to the president. We're going to, you know, mop up the whole world and everything's going to be under our control, you know, as, as if there's this. Hmm. It's it's perfectly symmetrical in their minds that they can be crooks every day running away from the government, but support the United States government unequivocally at all times. It's uh, and, and they they. Name that really well mm-hmm. in those later seasons the goodfellas is uh i think like one of the most perfect movie I, it's okay i think more like I, good movie yes you're oh, right you said it and those fellas they're not so good folks you gotta watch the movie to find out <laughs> i i could re-watch it a million times last night i didn't have you know two and a half hours free to re-watch the whole thing but i at least wanted to watch everything of kid henry hill because that is a lot of this episode or at least act two and and so yeah. and then after it was over, I was like, man, I, I I could just stay up till one and watch it. I didn't, but I've it's such a rewatchable movie. Like every and every movie, like it's so many movies ripped it off. It almost seems cliche now, but it still holds up. Yeah, yeah. yeah too oh, fun. absolutely. It's it's the ultimate. I know people don't surf channels anymore, but if it's on TV playing, even if it's censored or whatever, you, you just you just stop and you keep it on because it's like a big warm blanket you can pull over yourself. Well, two funny things that I really noticed while watching this episode one is that they never really returned to the Goodfellas well they weren't that interested because you think look after Goodfellas Godfather parodies and references go away no absolutely not there's like four mm-hmm. in seasons three and four I can think of just offhand Fat Tony yeah. does not 
not come back until season six with Homie the Clown. Mm. And wow. the following year, they do another Scorsese movie parody, and that's Cape Fear. And there's more beat for beat stuff in that. They're not doing beat for beat stuff. Maybe they weren't as confident. Maybe they thought people mm. wouldn't recognize certain references in this. But I, I was surprised by how little actual Goodfellas materials in this movie. And sorry, in the show. Yeah, you know, in the Cape, in the Cape Fear one, they definitely uh, were having senioritis, and they're like, you know what, we don't mm. care. But this is the start of season three and the start of the Gene and Reese run. So I think they were a little more cautious of like, well, let's not reference this movie's brand new and and everybody likes it right now. But if you get too (laughs) specific, you're going to lose the audience. That's much to the episode's benefit as well. I Mm -hmm. I, even in the golden era, I I think it's always better when they take something as inspiration and then make their own jokes and and plot twists rather than I'm not crazy when they're just doing something sideshow bob as robert de niro in mm. fear it's it, it there's a lot of great gags don't get me wrong but i i, I think this is a, a stronger way for them to parody stuff is to just take off the first little bit you get the cute little one fine day montage and then it becomes its own thing what i also think is funny from the behind the scenes is is like yeah i don't believe al Jean when he says they didn't really base this on goodfellas and Devil- he was joking it was a joke <laughs> well, no one laughs yeah. though that, that yeah. I, I feel like an idiot for bringing that up but like normally when someone says something sardonic everyone one laughs but like there's no it didn't it didn't come off like a gag when he said right it. right but yeah he I said totally it kind died. of flat you're right yeah it's like a drive it's very dry in that case he wasn't claiming they invented the idea of goodfellas i mean it was a book in 1985 yeah before well, this before. Well, then, but Rich Moore, like, is very clear that he was doing Goodfellas. And there are shots in this. They're like, well, that's a shot from Goodfellas. They're like, this is paced like one. I think from looking at it, though, they also, like, didn't have, they didn't have the VHS yet. They didn't have the double VHS box of of Goodfellas. I'm just going to steal a thought I saw on Twitter from somebody. But that's how movies are longer now, I think, because you don't have to sell two VHSs to sell a long movie now. (laughs) Like, a movie can be three hours on streaming or on a blue ray and it doesn't cost more production wise to resell it i think i think that's why another reason movies are very long now i i, I should have probably gotten this in earlier when we were talking directly about goodfellas but i i will say this this is this is a confession when i first saw like I, I watched that movie like 50 times at least when I was in high school and you know viewing 51 that I realized ugh, this is so embarrassing but when they're kids the, the portion you're talking about that's connected to this episode I did not realize that there's a that the kid Henry's you know starting crimes with is a young Joe Pesci right yeah. <laughs> he's got that slick back hair it was so he just I thought that Pesci was supposed to be a little bit older then watching it it is slightly comical that that kid is like this little like you know mini me Joe Pesci that <laughs> almost takes me out of the film in you know in the best way possible because it's entertaining yeah. I couldn't I, I just can't believe I didn't realize that and watching it again I, I don't know maybe everyone else knew it but if you if anyone watches this after this episode try not to laugh when you see this little <laughs> kid like dressed and who talks exactly like Joe Pesci but like an octave higher show up in the beginning of the film it caught me off guard if only if only they had the irishman technology then they could have just de-aged him (laughs) to a a 12 year old for that that's what they should do before he really fully retires give me like joe pesci and then like benjamin button him into a a a gangster infant and see what we can get out of that (laughs) one other thing i noticed is that bart seems to have more of like spider's job than good old hank hill he's just serving drinks Mm -hmm. but he has a much better faith than spider did yeah although i was pitching jokes in my head like i want to see millhouse as the spider character that gets murdered <laughs> by fat tony uh, did you call him hank hill intentionally i did i did yes. okay, yeah. okay i mean henry hill hank hill that's uh I need jokes I, I need jokes explained to me <laughs> the algene the algene thing was just the beginning here hey uh, uh he didn't deliver that joke very well so you're but you're both it's fair that you both assumed it was the truth you know what's so funny in sopranos every time they mention goodfellas like that they reference goodfellas in the world of sopranos i'm like don't any of you people like say like hey you look just like spider christopher you ever notice that, that you look just like that actor <laughs> or... and, and also it's uh goodfellas by the way um since we're talking a little gangster movie shop i i always i don't know what you guys feel i always uh, vastly preferred it to the Godfather movies. The Godfather movies are impeccably made. I'm not being too contrarian about it, but I, I remember the first time I saw them, I had seen Goodfellas first, and I found the Godfather movies, again, not talking about craft, but just on a, you know, 
personal level, it, it was all very sort of gaudy and and uh, the aristocratic angle of these these dynasties in the mafia. There's parts where you go back in time in, in part two with De Niro, uh, you know, as a young man. But um, it didn't it just didn't really it didn't have that grit and that <laughs> excitement that Goodfellas had where you're seeing it from the schlubs at the bottom was. And, and I think the Sopranos kind of balanced that well, where Tony is technically a boss, but he's a sort of a, a, a jersey as as uh, as Phil Leotardo says, you know, dismissively of, of the Jersey crew that they're, they're not a real crew mm-hmm. as far as the, the the New Yorkers are concerned. So uh, Sopranos and Goodfellas always captured my attention more than the Godfather, uh, you know, um, well, you know, the, I think uh, I, I, of course, love both Godfather Part 1 and 2. I mean, I think they're great, great films. And you know what? I'm, I'm kind of different. I think Godfather Part 2 is better than Godfather 1. Uh, <laughs> oh, wow. But anyway, no, I'm, I, but I, I do think, the, you know, the Goodfellas like kind of just expl- uh, it, it explodes the genre so much. And it's it is hard to go back after you see such a deconstruction of it about how like right. Godfather is uh, it's it's kind of about the role royal family of a mafia and it's like the kings fighting each other while meanwhile goodfellas is just you know a guy who's not even made in in the parlor it's like he's not that high level of a dude just telling you all the secrets of like hey these guys they swear all the time we murder somebody over nothing everyone's lying to your face all the time they'll all stab you in the back that's that's what the mafia is like it's just the right. series of lies and head mm-hmm. games to you like that that's what i i like more and then Unfor- an unfortunate thing for uh, every Scorsese film, which is about toxic masculinity and how awful these collections are, uh, the collection of men are, and how brutal they are to each other. Unfortunately, that goes over the heads of some people who just see it as like, yeah, this is about how awesome <laughs> it is to be in the mob, and I, I wish I was in that I just mob. think they got too drunk before the end of the movie and forgot how it ended. Yes. Like, oh, yeah. they're all happy and rich, right? <laughs> Banging broads. Well, and then they talk about on the commentary of this episode that the, apparently they were battling with the network or censors for a second because they, the censors were worried that showing Bart join the mafia might give kids a bad influence i.e. making them go and I guess join the Italian mafia if they yeah. if they felt like it join join a violence gang as Marge would say <laughs> no I think but I, I definitely think that sounded like uh, one of uh, the usual pearl clutching of censors from a very racially motivated standpoint because oh, sure, sure. As, as Gene put it on the commentary they thought it was Bart is joining the Crips or the Bloods like as in a modern gang full of uh, scary inner, inner city types sure yeah sure, but they let yeah. him make drinks yeah but but that's fine oh but if he if he was uh, you know if you replace that Manhattan with a malt beverage I think they right uh, yeah I think it'd be coded a little differently and the censors wouldn't like it uh, sure. I uh, I guess one last preamble thing I, I have on this one is just that I think a really interesting mix on this is you have Goodfellas as the uh, as obvious starting point but a lot of other mafia movies but you have goodfellas which is this deconstruction of the mafia movie by martin scorsese who had not done a mafia movie a true mafia movie for like 20 years of his career and here he's finally doing one and then you have john swartzwelder who his vision of mafiosos are from like 1938 films like that's the mafia (laughs) guys he wants to write about and so you have like his classicism meet meets the parody of a meta commentary on mafia films and it i think it That's leads funny. really interesting places yeah you, yeah it's it's a it's, so it's like a role reversal where you know the simpsons are supposed to be the ones parodying it but Schwarzenegger he even said uh, montaigne wasn't his first choice or in the, on the commentary they say he wanted uh, the name escapes me right now but at like a somewhat now obscure 50s classic gangster actor yeah it was actually and, uh sheldon leonard uh best sheldon known as nick the bartender mm-hmm. from it's a wonderful life out you pixies go <laughs> and he there we go. that's yeah. another thing why are you where do you get off calling me nick yeah exactly but he yeah. died in 97 and, and you know fat tony would not have come back after the late 90s then <laughs> that's the dangers of casting the elderly and stuff as the as... and and joe montagna uh pitch perfect mm-hmm. um one of the best extended universe characters and uh like like i said before um he's been in a lot of great movies he's he's uh, directed a lot of plays as well some of mammoth stuff he's a real you know career working guy um again house of games if you if you're not a 
you're not a Montana, Montani, Montaniac. Um, <laughs> I, li- I like and, it. I like it. <laughs> yeah, and and I came out so effortlessly too. Just go look up House of Games. And it's a really great movie where he plays a con man who um, li- uh, meets Lindsay Krauss, who's like a very high strung psychologist who wants to eventually play things a little dangerous, and she falls into his scene, and uh, he's he's really excellent, and not in the kind of funny. Uh, your parody way that he is is this fat tony and and i said this about our first production season three episode mr lisa goes to washington and i feel it even more in this one that this is uh we really loved season two when we redid it but this is a level up like this is like they adapt more to the guests that they like especially phil hartman they know phil hartman's good at this write this into this episode and also i think james l brooks is busy with his movie now uh <laughs> sam simon's kind of gone too or he's less in power it's gene and reese and so i don't think al james l brooks is around as much to say but focus this back on the family because this is a crazy ass third act that it yes. builds to it's yeah. so it like it's such a different kind of flavor than what aired even towards the end of season two it's like they're they're firing on all cylinders now yeah i mean compare this to when flanders failed like oh my god yeah it's a different series like almost yes. it's The Simpsons will be right back. At last they're here. New Butterfinger ice cream bars. Bad news. Crispity crunch at the outside, creamy ice cream inside. Nobody better lay a finger <laughs> on my Butterfinger. As far back as I can remember, I always wanted to be a podcaster. And I welcome you all to this week's break for Talking Simpsons. A big thank you to our guest, Brandon James, for coming on again. We really enjoy his stuff. Listen to Blowback. It is a great political history podcast. And it was so awesome to talk about mafia movies and The Simpsons with Brandon. And if you enjoy this week's podcast, you should know that, as always, Talking Simpsons is brought to you by the wonderful subscribers at patreon.com slash Talking Simpsons. Because without those subscribers, me and Bob couldn't do this as our full-time real jobs. And if you sign up at five bucks a month at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons, you not only get the satisfaction of assisting me and Bob, but also a ton of bonus content. You get to hear next week's episode of Talking Simpsons a week ahead of time and ad-free. And also you get access to two monthly bonus podcasts, Talking Futurama, where me and Bob cover Futurama super in-depth, just like we do The Simpsons, and Talking of the Hill, where we do it all over again for a new episode of king of the hill each month there's a giant back catalog over a hundred podcasts at that five dollar level you can listen to including us covering the critic mission hill and our 10 favorite episodes of batman the animated series check it all out for yourself at patreon.com slash talking simpsons But if you want something even fancier than a Manhattan, then you should head over to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons and check out that premium tier. For 10 bucks a month, you get all the $5 things I just mentioned. And then, then, oh boy, you get our exclusive monthly What a Cartoon Movie podcast where me and Bob talk about an animated feature film super duper in depth, just like we do an episode of The Simpsons. Recent ones have included the crown jewel of our What a Cartoon movies, Who Framed Roger Rabbit, where me and Bob talked for six and a half hours about the 1988 animation live action classic you gotta sign up there to hear the full thing and also at patreon.com slash talking simpson your ten dollar a month subscription gets you all of our previous ones covering movies like south park bigger and longer and uncut 1940s pinocchio and a huge back catalog going from everywhere from akira to a goofy movie beavis and butthead to america to the lion king tons and tons more giant back catalog at your fingertips over 250 hours of what a cartoon movies and at the end of this month you'll hear us talk about toy story 3 sign up at patreon.com slash talking simpsons to see it all right now uh oh you know on the commentary nancy cartwright is there for her first commentary ever and mm-hmm. 
she does bring it more than other cast members usually the other cast members there and we love them they're great but they're usually just there to like laugh along and didn't really prepare all that much it's like julie kavner oh, it's i just like hanging out with julie kavner oh bart's such a troublemaker <laughs> yes, yeah but, <laughs> but but nancy seemed to actually like dig out her old script and have notes on it and like i yeah. remember this i remember that like that i gotta give it to her for being more prepared than most of the actors are in the commentaries i was gonna say listening to it i did not realize that they say cartwright and presume Presumably uh, Yardley Smith, etc. Is it Yardley or Yardley? Yardley. Yardley, yeah. Yardley, sorry. Yardley Smith. They were not at the time publicly revealed as the specific characters they played. Like, like they, they tried to, maybe not by season three, but around that time. Is, was that another joke I'm not getting? Or is no, that no, no, you're to... right. That was true. They yeah, would appear and... in like uh, baseball hats and sunglasses. And people wanted to know like which person did which voice because they're always credited. Uh, everyone but the sure, guest stars early credited. on. But in one episode we did in season two, it's like they literally said Dan Castellaneta as Homer they showed you who played everyone right. like, in the credits just because people wanted to know oh that's old money yeah. old money right yeah. it just seems wild um, th- that you know nowadays even if a show was really popular an animated show was really popular there would be no ability to hide from people which was kind of a smart thing to do especially at that Bart mania you know the Simpsons the first two seasons was when it was such a craze that it's just sort of shocking that they even were successful in keeping people from knowing who who, who Bart was and who Lisa was for a while. You know, back then you really, in this pre-internet age, you really had to be in the know, like you had to be like reading Variety or LA Times pieces. <laughs> yeah, the maybe, trades. Yeah, to, to uh-huh. know uh, production on really anything. Like in that, I think that is also why like there was a real tension in the staff of Mac Rating getting credit for everything on The Simpsons. But at the time in the public imagination, they could remember one name associated with a TV show and it was Mac, Mac Rating's the one that yeah. they, uh, they memorized, you know? <laughs> Uh, yeah. One last thing about, you know, disguising the actors, you know, trying to make that a mystery. This is the fall season in which Herman's Head premieres, in which Yardley Smith plays a character with the voice of Lisa because that is her voice. Right. When you tune in, you're like, that's Lisa Simpson. <laughs> and true. Hank Azaria is on it, too, using his normal voice. But, yeah, just like they really couldn't hide it anymore. You've got a sitcom on the same network with two of the main actors of the show. Right. Right. And uh, and if I mean, if you were a, a super fan like of The Simpsons, you probably knew Dan and Julie from uh, Tracy Ullman mm-hmm. from that. Though I mean, I was six when I watched Tracy Ullman, so I didn't associate those human beings with uh, the cartoon characters. But but that's just me. Uh, but OK, the episode begins first with a little chalkboard gag about explosives in schools, which not <laughs> so funny now. The, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> the episode begins like I in general, like I, I say this every time, but Rich Moore, like he it's not surprising surprising he went on to be like an oscar winning uh theatrical animation director because he's like his episodes are great like he's Mm -hmm. i don't know if i'd say i personally like his more than jim reardon or wes archer david silverman because i think those are like the three kings but rich moore does like amazing stuff every time and he i mean he did the monorail which is like the most filmic episode of the show Mm -hmm. they ever did and and cape fear that was his last one he Uh, did for the show truly uh the uh, maybe the peak of animation in the series and and this opening yeah. of like it's a pan across the room to Bart in his bed and it's so I just love that it's framed it's framed with a poster of Krusty and then as you pan over you see more Krusties up to Bart's bed like this is this episode is not about Krusty and Bart's love of Krusty but you it's it's just a great little character thing for a pan across the room yeah. Krusty is not involved with the mafia quite yet not yet in the no. series <laughs> That was shocking when you, because uh, I I looked that up too of like okay mm-hmm. and then uh, Fat Tony he must come back next season because just in my head I think of him as all the time around but no it's season six three seasons later yeah that that surprised me when you told me that and is that homie the clown is that the one where he comes back yeah, yeah. another wow, john swartzwater dumb. script and i think he remembered oh right i have those characters yeah. i created why don't they show up again why make up new mafia guys yeah <laughs> yeah yeah exactly exactly uh um, yeah i i love i i love the cinematic because this is still is this still the Klasky chupo this is or, the last season of the, the yeah yeah because it, it has that i i feel most comfortable in that kind of season five through seven zone where everything's been normalized as i'm sure most people do but there is something pretty great about seeing these earlier seasons and the there's a little bit more expression and a little bit more kind of creativity you have to admit you know going on in the drawings oh yeah i love season three things are less clamped down you can get some wild 
wilder expressions, some more interesting camera moves. Uh, it looks really good. Yeah, you know, and I I think uh, it was gonna be Splitsville for Klasky Chupo and and The Simpsons <laughs> after the first season. Like I think I think their original deal was just four three seasons, and once that was over, like they they didn't get along with Klasky Chupo at Gracie. Uh, but I they were doing so well in this season. Like not the the film Roman people do a great job, and I think season four and five especially look great also. But I think they did lose a little something. There's just a little yeah. magic to this this season in its its animation. Definitely. Uh, but yes, Bart uh, jumps out of the wrong side of bed and steps on a, a, the pointiest of, of dinosaurs, the Stegosaurus. And, <laughs> uh, you know, as a little kid, this sadly did not teach me to pick up stuff off the floor of my room. I just, uh, I would still, I would just, uh, you know, a, a Spider-Man action figure is smooth anyway. It's not, <laughs> not going to hurt you like a Stegosaurus. That's why we let, that's why he's the most popular superhero is how smooth he is. <laughs> uh, oh, man, uh, I, a Batman with his pointy, pointy ears? Years, yeah. That's stabbing you oh, right through the heel. Yeah. Does Spider-Man have pointy... That's why I'm not, Go ahead, that's why I'm not seeing the new one. <laughs> too pointy. Does Spider-Man have to have like pointy villains like Electro? Is he pointy? Oh, Electro's all yeah. points. He's sure. got like five stars around don't, his thing. Don't yeah. leave that on the ground, yeah. kids. And uh, oh, and Green Goblin's long pointy nose and the point on his hat. Yeah, it's pointy. Pointy ears as well as a goblin. You know, You're right. He's pointing all over the place. <laughs> like, again, really just great animation of his like stepping on his hurt foot. Like it's just very well observed. I, uh, but I, I I love the uh, when the uh, the dog ate his homework and I didn't know dogs really did that. But the <laughs> equation that Santa's little helper spits out as an isolated equation is wrong. Also, yeah. like Bart's homework, he didn't do well on it. And we can actually see it. Like that's the classic Simpsons that I know going back in because I haven't watched it since the last time I was on the show. And it it felt it felt nice to see just that multi layered gag just unraveling, it, mm. you know, so beautifully. It's it's a great extra level to that joke, which is already good. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, he'd uh, he'd have been screwed anyway if he had put it in. Exactly. Yeah. (laughs) But yes, it's a bad start to Bart's day in our first clip here. Good morning, Lisa. What are you so happy about? Why shouldn't I be happy? It's a beautiful day. My homework is done. I got my mojo working and we're going on a field trip this afternoon. And looks like I got me a genuine glow-in-the-dark police badge. Hmm. Hey, it's not in here. You stole it! No one wants your stupid police badge, Bart. Hey, look what I got. (laughs) A genuine official police badge. (laughs) Calling all cars. Come out with your heads up. (laughs) Hey, that's my badge, Homer. That's Officer Homer. Oh, man, that's so... Okay, that was another thing I noticed in this episode. Schwartzwelder really gets Homer. This Homer is the Homer. Mm -hmm. Like, he's a big, dumb child who does not understand the dangers and things, (laughs) and he just... He's he's just a comedy cartoon dude in this episode. You you guys have been, you know, obviously, uh, you're you're embedded in all this, and I know you've been going back to these earlier seasons, like one and two. What is... Is this, like, early season three? Does it snap right? in or are there episodes where he's not quite this homer and then in by four or five it's 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 achieved do you you see like a transition point for homer Hmm. i think by the end of two he's kind of this guy well so in in the end of production season two with when flanders failed homer is still kind of like just a dumber sitcom husband who has a very sitcom thing though in the more wacky uh blood feud at the end of season two where homer homer has like i don't know like that he's <laughs> getting dumber and on bart's childish level but yeah i think with the upcoming episodes like say you know we've got flaming mo in a few episodes which is another big homer episode he's just mm-hmm. a big dumb idiot who hates being like paying any attention to his family like he just right. abandons his kids at a moment's notice this is where they uh, a simile with homer they're like no we know what homer is now like no more why are we pretending he is like a regular dad in any form Mm -hmm. at this point yeah The Homer I think of before this, more than anything, is just a, a, a jerk. I mean, I know jerk-ass Homer, ironically, came way later. But I'm thinking of the Flanders one where I know he does the right thing in the end or whatever. But the, one of my favorite gags is when he's imagining Flanders increasingly in trouble and then he dies. I think mm, too far. <laughs> yes. Like that, 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 that is, uh, he's more just kind of mean and irresponsible. But you're so right. When he walks in as pleased as a child would be at this toy, they've, they've, they've achieved a new level. <laughs> yeah, I guess. In, in, in Flanders failed like Homer harbors a resentment for Flanders uh, deep down when we know now he's like just too easily 
distracted to be mm. to have like a vendetta like that or to he just even doesn't like him after that yeah like, he just he just thinks he's annoying as opposed to the earlier more like adult homer with more adult reasons to dislike Fran- uh, flanders i guess yeah and- before he was stewing with like class-based resentment now like flanders will appear in the window go shut up flanders and then he'll go away <laughs> yeah. and homer will be happy again like in those in those early flanders episodes homer has like the cleverness to say something snide under his breath and it's like well that's not homer <laughs> homer would just scream right. it uh but yeah in this case he's like but basically he's bart's older brother who stole the yeah. he's not his father anymore <laughs> and and i also love the inside the the cereal box shot again just amazing shot yeah I, we go I, inside I, the cereal cabinet and then inside the box just these needless touches we don't need to be inside of these little components apartments but they put us there it's great type of stuff they wouldn't do on the show anymore you know i I hate to say well maybe 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 maybe, (laughs) who's to say uh though uh also negative henry (laughs) uh they also shout out that Schwarzwalder wrote the gag on the box of crusty saying only sugar has more sugar (laughs) but what a great line love that i also and love lisa lisa's uh, eating jackie o's yes yeah in keeping with with her ma- well i guess i don't know if, that, if that's a lisa specific joke but uh, you know it's he's eating. it's a democrat uh famous democrat woman i can see that sure. i the stretch pants joke seems a little mean like isn't that a fat joke at her expense that you would need stretch pants because like are they saying that that jackie o had gained weight i looked up photos of her like 90 or 91 and i don't hmm. i don't think she was particularly overweight but i mean people I were mean back then i don't know if she was a famous stretch pants wearer now yeah. they're just called uh, yoga pants or Spanx. <laughs> people right. love them we all love them yeah i when i searched uh jackie o 1991 news stories it was one that was uh a story told many years after 1991, but it was apparently a friend of Jackie O's said about her posthumously that in 1991, she asked her friend to hook her up with Alec Baldwin and she went on a date with Alec Baldwin in 1991. So, which, uh, yeah, she... She was like 51 then and Baldwin was 33. So good for her. Yeah. Uh, d- apparently it didn't go, didn't go more than one night with, uh, with her and Baldwin. Mm. Sadly though. It, uh, but, uh, that is sad. Uh, but, give, give her a break. Her mind, husband was killed. <laughs> sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Wait, what, what would you say? I I'm said, sorry. give her a break. Her husband was killed. <laughs> yeah. I was about to say, that sounds like one of the things the psychic would say in this episode. It's not looking good for Alec Baldwin and uh, Jackie O. And they were so handsome. Happy. Uh, so happy. <laughs> yeah. uh, also, it's funny for an episode where Bart joins the real mafia. He couldn't be a fake cop. This is what happens, you know. If you can't become a cop, you become a mobster. That's uh, there's only two options in the in the Italian immigrant world back then. But <laughs> but anyway, the uh, yes, Sam's little helper eats his homework to Bart's shock that a dog actually does that. His excuse came through. Then he it seems like Otto really screws Bart here because he should realize like, hey, Lisa is on here. I should probably wait for Bart. But uh, Lisa, the- Lisa is oddly vindictive with this just sarcastic wave to Bart. Yeah. And then her at the candy factory saying he needs to learn his lesson. I know. This will teach him. Uh, that also feels more swans sw- sw- of like uh, the way women are written in this one in <laughs> In general, I think. Are there women in this trust besides Lisa? I can't even think of. Uh, Marge, Marge says, I don't favorite. know if that's a good idea. Exactly. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. She's serving her uh, role in this in this uh, early part of the show. Uh, yeah. This is also one of those moments on the commentary where I was like, God damn, they didn't they didn't save any of the deleted scenes for Klasky Chupo or they're te- I still think it's possible they technically own the footage is owned by Klasky Chupo and they don't want to make mm. a deal with them. But they mm. mentioned a deleted scene on this that they fully animated in color, not cut at the animatic of what sounded brilliant and i bet rich moore and his team did a great job of it of like that bart gets splashed by one car but he's supposed to be splashed by cars like almost every step of his way to school and and they uh rich moore says they got all the way to color and it got cut and i think that was just fun of like it sounded like rich moore was getting his shots in of like yep <laughs> you cut it it looked really great and you cut it he said it, it was really hard to figure out yeah he was he was yeah. mourning the loss of this joke <laughs> then bart arrives and and uh, this is just a quick clip, but anytime I'm late, I think of uh, the way Bart says this. Bart Simpson, you're late. Go fill out a tardy slip. But I'm only 5, 10, 20, 40 minutes. That's pretty damn late. <laughs> <laughs> just the acceptance of like that you're about to make an excuse. And then as you're counting the time, you're like, you know what? That is pretty late. You're right. You know? <laughs> I feel bad we're about to lose casually swearing Bart, though, in the show. Yeah, yeah. Because uh, that he was a bad influence in that respect. I know. They, yeah. 
it wasn't that the censors told the, as as we were told by John Beatty in our interview with him uh, that to take a shot. I mentioned to go back to an old <laughs> interview, listeners. But we, in our interview with that, he said that it wasn't censors coming to them, but it was their colleagues in the comedy world who did have children who were like, "Well, thanks for teaching my kids the word bastard," and <laughs> they, so they themselves pulled back on it if, for for that very reason. That is exactly why, uh, as we discussed last time, that is exactly why I was not allowed to watch the show. My mom thought that mm-hmm. if uh, if I watched Rugrats, Simpsons, whatever, <laughs> kids are talking sass and mm-hmm. that I would immediately do the same thing. And for all I know, she's right. I never ended up watching them until I was older. So that was why. We we had that with the, we did the South Park movie recently, a whole podcast on that. Oh, yeah. And, and definitely the, the film is about like, you know, moms shouldn't care so much about their kids uh, swearing. But the, the start of the movie does clearly make the point of like, oh, yeah, <laughs> if kids went and saw an R-rated movie, they would say every swear word they heard over and over and over again they would instantly yep. repeat it yeah which i did anyway i just through osmosis you mm-hmm. know i didn't see the primary source but um yeah it's uh i'm glad i'm a grown-up now and i can watch whatever <laughs> i want uh bart splits his pants in front of all the girls saying hey girls look at we me laugh a lot yeah that's great i just love look at me like it's such a stupid it's not really clever or funny. It's just really, it's re- well, it is funny to me that he just goes, look at me and his pants immediately split. It's not like classic Simpsons wit. It's just very funny that it immediately happens to him and he's a laughing stock. I love that. You can stop looking at me now. That's a great. <laughs> uh, and then Bart gets just smashed right in the face with a kickball, crashes to the ground and probably concussed, I would guess. And, then, and, and you know, they don't do this animation choice. I like it though. Like the reddening under his eye is, is, is really well done. Yeah, it's that's like th- a little airbrushed almost. Mm-hmm. That's not how they do like a black eye later in the series, but it's it's very realistic. And then then Bart thinks finally though he's uh, this all this pain today will be worth it because he's gonna get to go on the field trip. Well, it's nearly one o'clock, and you know what that means. Yay! That's right. It's time for our field trip to the chocolate factory. I trust you all remembered to bring your permission slips. <laughs> What a day. <laughs> I'm gonna eat eight pieces of chocolate. How many chocolate shall I barf? Oh, don't worry, Bart. We'll find something fun for you to do. Ah, here we are. There's a whole box of unsealed envelopes for the PTA. You're making me lick envelopes? Oh, licking envelopes can be fun. All you have to do is make a game of it. What kind of game? Well, for example, you could see how many you can lick in an hour. And then try to break that record. Sounds like a pretty crappy game to me. Yes, well, get started. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, this was my greatest uh, fear as a child in school, and uh, one that gave me even more anxiety about this this whole forgetting your permission slip. It never happened to me. Man, I figure you could just call your parent now, and their parents are much more reachable, and just say, like, yeah, if you forgot it. But yeah, I, uh, I never missed a permission slip. Uh, though also now, I think as an adult, this episode I had no questions about as a kid. As an adult, I'm like, come on, a trip to the chocolate factory, that starts, you don't do any part of the school day. You go there at like 9 a.m., you get on that bus you don't go there one but i i also uh, really liked how the permission slip is beautifully and pristinely laid out uh, <laughs> right under his pillow like just waiting to be remembered and he somehow missed it and just that real i mean it is very we've all been there of like just in the middle of the day it hits you like i left that at home like i didn't yep. bring it with me god damn it just and then, then you scream yeah, and then you scream, man, what a scream by Nancy, too. I uh, Speaking of people, like, getting out aggression on the commentary, <laughs> I like she mentions, like, boy, we worked, like, from 10 to 6 on a lot of these episodes <laughs> back then, and Al Jean is kind of like, well, you know, we just wanted a lot of good lines. We were probably overdoing it then. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but, uh, yeah, a great scream, uh, and I love, like, his face kind of, the way his face splats into the book, like, that's another just, like, great animation bit there. And also, yeah. when the pan to his house like i love all the crazy like squ- uh, squiggly lines they do for like long yeah. pans always great it's really cool zip pan yeah i would think that uh the harvard nerds who who write on this show probably went through a lot of like high school en- envelope stuffing things for transcript <laughs> boosting purposes like this but yeah also when I, I talk about things leveling up for this episode i absolutely feel that with skinner as well so skinner definitely was a nerd who loved his mama in 
even in the like the his second or third appearance in season one but he still was like he's the stern principal even in season two in this episode while he is bart stern principal he also is a big nerd who loves yep. stupid boring games like this and and science i was gonna say at the end we're i don't want to skip to the end fully but like at the end i love that it sets up the you know basis of what you know in bart's comet most most uh <laughs> famously that he's a big science nerd and macgyvers himself because he, <laughs> he loves science so much this is the Skinner who loves Diorama Rama Day, who <laughs> yeah. who, who, count, who st- says every type of detergent in front of him slowly. Like this, <laughs> this is that Skinner. Like this is them uh, leveling up Skinner to the character we love. Like yeah, this is just so ma- it's just so magical to see once they start season three. Like just them figuring out, like finally locking it all into place for so many characters. Yep. Yep. The only thing that's just a little bit older style is his voice is a little bit more um, kind of hoity-toity. He's just he's got that kind of like it's it's more stern. More deeper. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but but then uh, but yeah, his character at this point is is pretty much the Skinner that that you know Skinner's one of my favorite characters. I can't imagine that's unpopular. Mm. And uh, yeah, it, it felt like it didn't feel like they were still figuring him out when I when I turned this on. And uh, they apparently got that crappy past the censors because they said it's an adjective, not a noun, to describe you know feces. It's crappy. <laughs> <laughs> Which we head to the off fudge chocolate factory. Sadly, you know they never off fudge was not a consistent thing. It, you know from then on, if they wanted to do like candy, it's the crusty bar. Like they yeah, they kind of right. central all their businesses around crusty after that coco beanie never returned oh i love him the way he goes my oh, god what a great little sound he made it's coco beanie himself <laughs> i just love that millhouse has been thinking about this for years he's been dreaming of it he is he is the nerds who love the mascots going to stuff and by that i mean yes. us as well and uh, me at least <laughs> sure. i'll say but uh so i i've never toured a chocolate factory i have as a kid toured the coca-cola factory and as an adult went to the jelly belly factory in in California, uh, which is known uh, for its painting in jelly beans of Ronald Reagan. It's a very pro Reagan uh, he, <laughs> jelly bean. Well, that's his favorite. That was his favorite food. Seriously. And I mean, if you're a California Republican, which I'm sure the owners of the Jelly Belly Factory are, uh, then you he's like God to you, Ronald Reagan. Speaking of that, this is a little bit of a tangent, but fun fact. Scott Walker, former Wisconsin governor, is such a uh, Reagan freak that on his own birthday, which I don't know if it's because she shares a birthday with Reagan, maybe that's why, he like dresses everyone up, you know, in like America stuff and has everyone come and he serves jelly beans and he like plays Reagan movies and it's like he reenacts all of Reagan's favorite things to do in, in, in his life. That's creepy. And, uh, you know, tracks with his... <laughs> with his personality he obviously. pretends to have but... dementia towards the end of the day <laughs> he, yeah, he <laughs> wanders just around, around <laughs> talks about how he liberated uh you know uh, death camps that he never did yeah all that stuff if it's like 4 30 in the afternoon he doesn't recall a lot of stuff he's like yeah, <laughs> exactly he's, he's, yeah it's a, it's a sunset but uh yeah I, I always thought that was one of the most disturbing things i ever heard is that you serve jelly beans on your birthday because <laughs> reagan liked them oh uh, god that's uh it is creepy but hey, jelly belly they make some good beans i, 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 I bet I, they do yeah but <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, the uh, the off fudge. I just love it's called off fudge. Like what a funny I, a name for it. And yeah. all right, and talking about leveling up stuff. Okay, so yes, Troy McClure had appeared before. Mm-hmm. It even said in his first appearance, you may remember me. But what he didn't do was host a video for children to watch. Like this, it was an infomercial. Like this is them really figuring out Troy McClure as well. I think. And Phil Hartman didn't know if he wanted to do this again. Uh, his response yeah. to them was, yeah, it was kind of fun, guys, but I don't want this to be a regular thing but then he eventually like leaned into it embraced the character and we'd be back countless times so many and times. like in the early parts of the show they have him playing multiple characters throughout just like when john lovitz would come on earlier yeah yeah and this- he's the guy who says i did not know this he's the guy who says the wonderful line um what have i done to deserve this flavorless manhattan apparently mm-hmm. i i wouldn't have even necessarily guessed that 
No, he's he's great. It, I miss hearing him as one-off voices in later episodes, but I can see why they're like, ah, you know, it's it's distracting now if you hear a Hartman sure. voice as somebody else. But yeah, I love hearing him as secondary one, and that's why Hutz is back too. Yeah. Oh God. And and then and yeah, this uh, this also is kind of a sequel to you know the second episode ever of The Simpsons is the kids touring the nuclear plant, and they get pretty similar sequence to this, except it's hosted by Smile and Joe Fishin. This is a way better version of that also like just so good and it's and it's made that way because troy mcclure is perfect like he's just the way he walks up to the podium that's shaped like a chocolate bar and leans <laughs> over it like just i love that perfect uh but uh but yes yeah, so let's let's hear good old troy my man welcome to the chocolate factory i'm troy mcclure <laughs> You probably remember me from such films as The Revenge of Abe Lincoln and The Wackiest Covered Wagon in the West. <laughs> the history of chocolate starts with the ancient Aztecs. In those days, instead of being wrapped in a hygienic package, chocolate was wrapped in a tobacco leaf. And instead of being pure chocolate like we have today, it was mixed with shredded tobacco, and they didn't eat it. They smoked it. <laughs> you didn't believe me when I said it would be fun, did you? No, sir. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, I want to get just a little of that in there, but you know, Troy's a professional. I love his "Welcome to the Chocolate Factory." Oh, the chocolate yeah, it factory. almost it almost sounds like like ominous. Mm. He says it in a very low, rumbling voice, almost um, sexual. I'd say. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, he loves it. I, uh, you know, my internal uh, guess here, I may be just making up canon here, but I think All Fudge is owned by Laramie Cigarettes, and that's why they have such a long <laughs> sequence of showing kids how fun it is to smoke tobacco. That's oh, like, I like it. <laughs> And in case you totally, I totally agree with that. I thought that was kind of the underbelly of the gag. That if you, if you're really, it's just like, why are these kids being shown so, you know, meticulously how to smoke? And if you didn't get the Chief Wahoo gag, he just does the smile at the end. Yep. Yeah, he does. (laughs) Which, which I, I definitely view as them mocking how blatantly racist (laughs) the character of Chief Wahoo was even then. I, I I, I agree. It's one of those gags that, um, you know, because it's an old. I don't know how old it's supposed to be. Troy McClure's not that young in it, but like it's it's an old stuffy video where you would see that kind of dated stuff in school, and, and so I think it's one of those gags that actually ages better, mm-hmm. you know, because as as that stereotype gets you know ages poor, more more and more poorly, you know, the uh, a gag like that, you just go, oh my god, and the <laughs> shock value like kind of hits even harder. I think I said this before on the podcast. I grew up in Ohio. For the longest time, I didn't know Chief Wahoo was supposed to be a person. I thought he was like a <laughs> baseball demon <laughs> because if you look at the uh the kansas city chiefs or you know uh, the redskins the the head looks like a person's head it's still racist but this is like some 1930s caricature that does not look like a human being at all i know that's the point but i was yeah. like this is a person <laughs> yeah like that's what again it's just it's so it, it strikes especially the modern eye is just so out there and bizarre that this is this was supposed to be like a normal depiction of anything which of course you know it wasn't it was a fantastical racist image so yeah it, it is it is ridiculous but i i, I love that that's that's a really good early uh, mcclure uh, video and i love the wackiest covered wagon in the west <laughs> and uh according to wikipedia the aztecs and cocoa beans nothing to do with tobacco <laughs> like i think they just like make it up like certainly the aztecs used it a lot it was uh <laughs> some of the people they conquered would be forced to uh make it uh, and grow them as part of their crops if they were used as like money as well and they they drank their chocolate cold as well the aztecs of course and and they would uh, be used as rations for aztecs tech soldiers so and hey it was from wikipedia so it must be true and and it's totally (laughs) he totally find a source it but yeah as as bart i also just love bart watching these slow seconds get slower and slower and then tick backward again just amazing joke such a good joke excellent joke i i love how just awful and and um ragged his tongue has become that the little like bumps the like yellow bumps just showing like it's sandpaper at this point oh god yeah it's it's so painful and and you know what i look sometimes when your glasses drop you do have to say my glasses like it's (laughs) what else can you say in those moments you're letting everyone know don't move (laughs) yes my glasses stop my glass yeah it's just what you got to say god all that stuff is so gross with the chocolate mayhem disgusting like especially i think it's a very intentional choice that it's 
Wendell, the barf kid who's swimming around in the chocolate. If it could be any kid, it's <laughs> Wendell doing it. Uh, and the shot of the shot of Ralph on the conveyor belt. That's another great shot. Yes. It is. Ralph is coming into his own, too. Like everyone is emerging in yes. this episode, yeah. really. Yeah. The Simpsons got a lot out of going to a factory humor because you mentioned they've already done it once the box factory one of the best things the cracker factory that uh no house's dad works at it's they they did not run out of factory stuff for a long time well, let's not forget the cider town as well yeah of course yeah. oh my god yeah <laughs> uh and uh, yes also they were really into harry shearer playing effeminate men who tell people like play sanitary children like he just <laughs> was so they they had him do at least one effeminate voice an episode this is a smitherless episode so they <laughs> have to get the gay voice out of a different guy he's he's in it but he's not saying anything oh that's true he's no, being no, he says he does doesn't oh. he say something even though they reuse old footage yes I, I barely count that scene i don't like that uh we'll get to it but you're right okay. you are okay. i stand corrected but yes the kids beating and kicking coco beady like that's also just great <laughs> and uh then yes the sound of the sandpaper against bart's tongue i i just have a quick clip here of it because like again i think nancy does a really i'm glad she's on the commentary because this she is really great this whole episode <laughs> Can I go now? What? <laughs> Can I go now? Mm. Well, there's still a minute to go. No, why not? But don't you tell your teacher I'll let you go home early. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> that's so great and bart does right with his left hand i'm on mm. left hand watch okay. since we just did the leftorium one so uh but yeah just is that seymour again what a great nerdy skinner thing that he like is thinks it's delightfully devilish to let bart out 30 seconds early from school he's just like <laughs> oh, well. like it's so it's so cute this his dorkiness yeah. uh and so yes bart leaves it instantly starts raining on him all the kids are in the bus coming back from their fun chocolate factory <laughs> splashing bart how can it get any worse bart like the wheel breaks off his skateboard and he tumbles down the stairs right in front of the legitimate businessman's social club and bart gets a whole <laughs> bunch of guns pointed at him which oh uh, great shot yes that if somebody has that cell it must cost like eighty thousand dollars it's a perfect cell it's so great i and i not to brag but i did use it for a slightly viral post about simpson's opinions i said uh, hey what what i i look i i was scrounging for it i wanted to go viral <laughs> i was like okay everybody's got the knives pointing at people spot uh i know there's a scene like that from simpsons i'm gonna take that shot and ask people for their uh what simpsons opinion will get you this thing like and, and everybody fell for it and it was great it was a great day for me <laughs> genius <laughs> that's all that matters now yeah hey it's engagement you just ask an open-ended question with a good picture that's that's playing twitter now that's how it is <laughs> uh don't hate the game guy but all right so yes you wonder why bart is has a bunch of guns pointed at him it also is like this is the beginning of the simpsons love a cocked gun like there's yeah. so many so many jokes in the show about cocking a gun at somebody <laughs> well it's 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 and it is funny there's something just it immediately ups the stakes in a way that is somehow comical where now if life or death is involved you know mm. where it wasn't a second ago it is it is funny every time and uh, so yes we get our first introduction to fat tony and uh, the rest of his mobster regulars which there wouldn't really be a consistent new member of the crew until season 12 with uh, Johnny Tight Lips. And what about Jimmy the Scumbag? And Jimmy, all oh, right, Jimmy the Scumbag in nine. You're right. Yeah. <laughs> but, but yeah, Fat Tony, based on Paul Servino's Goodfellas character. Uh, and yeah, I think, you know, if they'd gotten Sheldon Leonard, he'd be dead yeah. uh, by like the, his after his second appearance, he'd be dead. And there's some interesting Fat Tony lore because technically he dies in the season 22 episode Donnie Fatso, but the big gimmick is he's replaced with fit tony and the stress of being in the mafia makes him overeat he turns back into fat tony so as a gimmick they they replace it's sort of like a, a armin tamzarian kind of situation yeah. but no one freaked out about it it's just like he's a new character now but it's still joe montania we're still doing the same jokes and that happened now like over a decade ago snowballs too has been dead for a long time yeah also. yeah but yeah that's great it, it, i have to remind myself in canon this fat tony's been dead for about 12 years now i think or so or at least a decade because homer was uh, it's, it's called donnie fatso because homer 
Whereas um, he's turned, uh, he's wearing a wire when meeting uh, Fat Tony. Yeah. And you know what? I'm sad we never went there, but his Burbank restaurant, Eat Chicago, or sorry, Taste Chicago, closed in 2019. <gasps> oh, no. Yeah. Oh, wow. I would have figured the pandemic would shut it down. Nope. Man. It was open for over a decade. Wow. Uh, that's too bad, man. I I would want, uh, you know, if I'm going to have a, uh, a an Italian beef sandwich from anywhere, I'd want it served to me for my Joe Bundy. <laughs> Uh, at least, you know, I hope the Danny Trejo restaurants we ate at in Burbank are still, or in Hollywood are still open. Those were both the donut mm. place and the taco place were really good. And do you think they went to him because he was in Godfather 3? That, that's the reason, right? Yeah, Godfather 3 was also 1990, which, all, yeah. I mean, Godfather 3, I thought there was like a slight critical reappraisal of it as not that bad uh, recently, or there was a re-release of it, but... It was like a recut um, version. Coppola put it out and called it the Coda or something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I didn't really understand. I, I just saw an ad for it. I, I didn't look into it further. And everybody was really mean to Sofia Coppola mm-hmm. about that too. Which uh, she but, showed them. Yeah, she showed it. <laughs> yeah, uh, <laughs> it's it's insane that the Coppola is just like it's it's like uh, they own Hollywood. They own a chunk of Hollywood. Their entire family of them. Like there's mm. there's too many of them. Jason Schwartzman's one of them too. He is. Don't man. forget that. Yep. Let's talk one about. My, oh, sorry, Brandon. What, what, one of my favorite uh, lines from the Larry Sanders show is when Hank is making a uh, goodbye tape for Larry and he has Bruno Kirby and he keeps giving Bruno Kirby notes to shoot this dumb little happy birthday wish on tape. And Bruno Kirby's like, I was in the, go- I, I can't believe I'm getting notes. I was in the Godfather. And he goes, Hank is like, I don't remember you in that. He goes, yeah, go- Godfather part two. And he goes, uh, well, I, I've only seen the third one, you know. So <laughs> we have uh, to talk about. Let's talk uh, about it. Frank Severo. He played Frankie Carbone in, in Goodfellas. Uh, you know, honestly, a very minor character. Uh, oh, get- so my little my, my little weird obsession with that character is an actual topic here. Absolutely. Oh, he's, yeah. he's I a, didn't even realize this. No, absolutely. He's a very unique looking man. This is a caricature of him. I don't think Legs is a caricature of anyone in the movie, though. Maybe I should look through all the mobsters and try to place him. I you couldn't when I watched you it. You know, Legs with his slick back hair and all that to me the one he looks the most like is tony cicero the future Polly walnuts who's Hmm. in the movie like he has the very slick back hair and his hair was that color then okay not the perfect you know gray wingtip uh hair we all love of Polly walnuts and 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 in the movie he does do the listeners can't see but i'm doing the Polly walnuts index and pinky uh, hand wave yeah. he does that in goodfellas that's true mm. yeah well frank severo uh tried to sue the simpsons in 2014 so 13 years after this airs he tried to sue i guess gracie or fox it was fox, it was fox. television yeah, yeah uh for 250 million dollars because they drew a caricature of him based on how he appeared no. in goodfellas yeah mm-hmm. yeah which i had no idea i had no idea and again it's so funny on the commentary knowing that because the, the commentary i believe is 2002 they don't know in, in 12 years they're going to be sued by the guy. But they're just like Rich Moore saying that he, Al Jean is like, is that supposed to be Mike Reese? And then, because they, every character, they drew like eight characters that look like Mike <laughs> Reese on the show. He's a fun looking man. Uh, and then yeah. Rich Moore's like, oh, no, no. I I thought I told him to do Joe Pesci, which I was like, wait, what? Because it's not just his poofy hair looks like Frank yeah. Sivero, but it's like the cheeks. That, he's a very hatchet yeah. faced man. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And yeah, he's. Oh, he looks like he's a dead ringer for the Goodfellas character. That's why, without knowing this entire story, I just assumed it was him. And uh, yeah, that uh, Bob, you linked me to a great uh, deconstruction of the whole thing uh, from Cartoon Brew that kind of put it uh, all into perspective once his final appeal went through in 2018. But he he lost that lawsuit uh, to Fox. I, I think he had like never seen The Simpsons before because he made some wild claims. Like I think in his head, Frank Severo thinks this is the the Louis show because he said, oh, yeah, in, in, in 89, I was living near some of the writers and they obviously saw me and got ideas for this character <laughs> he he thinks this louis guy is just like the big he's like he's like another like skinner or flanders on the show louis is probably has like a hundred lines total across 30 years yeah. i if bet that yeah that's really funny i bet you could find if you were searching for merchandise that featured louis like i'd say at best you'd find like three f- toys tops of him or like and, yeah a, a, maybe a, a car trading card or whatever and louis is always dan castellana doing a joe pesci impression in this episode and in 
in um, Homie the Clown, it's Hank Azaria doing a kind of De Niro for legs, but after that, Harry Shearer plays legs. Oh, right. Yeah. I forgot they swapped. Yeah. I, uh, also, that cartoon Bruce story you, you link me to, Bob, they make a great point about how, like, from a cartoon production standpoint, it's really good that he he the, he had no chance with this lawsuit, but if it had actually succeeded, it would, would have kind of fucked up all cartoons because <laughs> yeah. it, it, he, like, the judge was like, this is a transformative work and it's a free pe- speech thing. You are a public celebrity and they drew a caricature of you, even if they intentionally did so. It's no different from, you know, the 8 million Bugs Bunny cartoons where he meets, like, Clark Gable or Humphrey Bogart, you know? Like, they couldn't show the Sherry Bobbins episode anymore. Yes, yeah, it's, uh, it, it would, it would have destroyed a parody law if the guy had won so i mean hey i think they should just give him give him two million bucks disney what's it to you you know yeah throw him something yeah he's not 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 250 million or whatever you said and it's extra funny though that to read how the court case was settled because it's exactly what marge describes to homer at the end of this episode <laughs> like that's <laughs> that legal precedent is so that's that's an extra funny uh <laughs> end to it but but really i'm shocked they didn't make him just pesci like pesci is like the most who remembers frankie carbone from goodfellas like you you remember his death that's the only thing i re- can think he's about after he's on the meat hook yeah. yeah but you joe pesci was so good at goodfellas every he got cast in everything to just like <laughs> can you just do that can you just do that in this comedy now it rules that just a few months later he was one of the web bandits right just yes. a few months later <laughs> in in cinemas <laughs> and uh swearing and then came up back for a sequel he yeah was, he loved he loved being a web bandit <laughs> but yes let's hear why don't we hear our first ever appearance of fat tony hey what's with the kid hands off the material what do you know the kid's tough. He's got spunk. I wonder if he is lucky also. Pick a horse, kid. <laughs> Shelbyville Downs, third race. Make it a good one. Eat my shorts. Eat my shorts. Ah, okay. Let's see. <laughs> hey, wait a minute, you little punk. Eat my shorts is in the fifth race. I said the third race. Don't have a cow. Hmm. Don't have a cow in the third. Put a deuce on him. <laughs> While we are waiting to see how lucky you are, let me show you around. This is our bar, and over there is our slot machine and card tables. Cool. Hey, boss, here's the call for the third race. As they come out of the turn, it's suffering circuit dash by a neck over yabba dabba doo. Two lengths back to eight, I have sticker, and that's all, folks. I am what I am, can see them all. But here comes Don't Have a Cow flying on the outside, and at the wire, it's all Don't Have a Cow. Hey, I like this kid. I can't believe we were going to shoot him. Can you mix <laughs> drinks? I don't know. I'll have a Manhattan. Make legs of Manhattan. I'm not sure. Like, again, the second time in the episode, a joke is punctuated with guns cocking. Like, <laughs> that's such a Simpsons thing. Uh, again, it's it's been a little while, but um, Eat My Shorts is in the fifth race. That whole setup still caught me off guard. <laughs> I thought it was just going to be a cute little joke how Bart's being sassy. And then it's like, nope, they, they always go the extra mile. They always take it to the logical conclusion. We were talking about how good this episode looks. One thing I associate with season three uh, is, like, lots of shadows. It's a lot of extra work. It's an extra layer. It's an extra bit of figuring things out. And they're all always in shadows in the the social club and also when uh, fat tony is showing off both sides of the club oh my god the in-camera animation move it's not Love just that. it's great it's not just painting across one piece of artwork it's like drawing a new frame for every time the camera is moving across the background that's a lot of work they didn't have to do but it looks so good and most people won't even notice it it's it's so opulent like even even in a great season like season eight i don't think they do that shot they, they would just say like over here is that cut to just yep. a, a shot of that and over here is this and then they just cut to it yep. and, and and you wouldn't miss it you wouldn't be like oh that looks cheap it, because the joke would be expressed but this extra yeah. sauce like is just so great <laughs> like yeah and- sauce yeah it's gravy it's extra it's gravy, gravy. Uh, but yeah i i so agree that's what i meant watching this this is a this has been observed before i'm sure but it's like the simpsons isn't really a show where you need that extra craft or like cinematic touch so you you like you say you don't miss it there's even something maybe funny about the kind of more direct hard cuts that would happen in later seasons of that kind of very that's a very simpson like thing to just then hard cut to something rather than do a kind of flowery cinematic lead up to a joke but we get both in the golden era i guess because these earlier seasons it really is lovely to see i that shot you're talking about really stood out to me i thought it was so 
so cool looking and they have so many great jokes in the series about the show's popularity but this is a good like underrated one that bart bart's cartoon catchphrase is now on the level of all those other ones in universe that don't don't have a cow is and also this is like a joke about don't have a cow being mm -hmm. tired and and the thing yeah. from t-shirts i i think uh this is the last time bart says don't have a cow himself or at least for years and years i think i think the next time it's said is when lisa says it as a joke pretending to be him in season oh. seven and then they do it in the simpsons spinoff showcase when bart sings his verse he's like eat my uh, shorts don't, don't have, have a cow that's right. yeah. yes yeah. <laughs> so uh then they instruct him to uh make a manhattan which oh and also put a deuce on it it's it's definitely uh a parlance for a bet but i couldn't find like in horse racing terms what a deuce means deuce in other gambling scenarios it means certain other things i assumed but, it was like 200 or 2000 or I, I think Something so. Like that. There's uh, the best I could find was there was a 1965 Sports Illustrated article about this new thing in horse racing, which is looking at statistics of how many times a horse is run won, <laughs> and it's like, wow, you need a computer for all this stuff. And the headline was, before you put a deuce on a horse, you better run the computer. And <laughs> And that uh so that it was used in the same way he did which that is more of the Schwarzwelder old timey mobster movie way of talking they give these characters and yeah so bart is instructed to mix a drink uh so on the thing bart has in front of him i believe that is an accurate way to make a manhattan but it asks for an italian whiskey which i mean would fit for what the mafia would want though i think more commonly it is rye whiskey is the mm. main risky whiskey you use in a manhattan i've i've never mixed one for myself i probably ordered them at a bar just because i was like oh i should have one of these like from the show <laughs> but uh it's it's not my preferred cocktail i think uh though i mean hey i, I like a little fruit in a cocktail but i guess i like a little more fruit uh, instead just the hint of cherry who are you kidding henry <laughs> you are a girl drink drunk i am a girl drink drunk it's true <laughs> yes but I, I i'm not a i'm i'm not really into manhattans but it, it looks it looks strangely appetizing in the in the show oh, it's it like how great. in cartoons everything thing tastes you know <laughs> like 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 candy when you're a kid you're like oh that probably tastes like i think of that that peep show uh moment sorry to bring up peep show on us on the simpsons podcast <laughs> but where jeremy is uh is taking someone out to dinner and he and he accidentally or he ends up buying a really expensive bottle of bottle of wine and regretting it because it's too pricey and then he finally drinks it and he's trying to hide his disappointment and he's like mm, yeah really delicious i mean not <laughs> actually delicious like coca-cola or hot chocolate but for wine <laughs> delicious uh but the manhattan looks it, it looks tasty in this so yes, I'll, give, I'll give it that speaking of bad influences when I, was, when I was a kid watching this i thought those look pretty good these yeah. drinks look good yeah. <laughs> and here's a 10 year old just like me making them i bet it, it looks really great yeah i think you know we just shook loose this memory in my mind that I actually got a call to my parents in fourth grade because I wrote like a short story or just some activity where I said eat my shorts in it like my <sighs> character said it because I hadn't watched The Simpsons but I heard Bart say that and I wanted to look cool and for my and for my friends making a funny line so I stole a funny line from a popular thing and then it was naughty and that doubled my mom's opposition to the Simpsons because wow. I had been, you know, uh, gotten in trouble for saying something naughty in, in school. So these are coming back to me <laughs> as, as we talk. It's so funny because Bart didn't invent Eat My Shorts. They gave him just like a corny old thing he would have seen on TV or something. Like Eat My Shorts is such an old catchphrase. It took me a long time before I realized shorts means underwear. Yeah, right, right. It doesn't mean <laughs> yeah. like the shorts I'm wearing. Yeah, yeah. Oh, you know what's a really, what always sounded like a really nasty one that's in a wholesome show is is sit on it. Yeah. Like, in happy days sit on it i mean i don't think it takes that much imagination to imagine what you could be telling someone to do yeah yet it's <laughs> it's in the wholesome 50s universe uh, where ron howard and potsy are saying it that was weird. their way of saying get fucked yeah <laughs> <laughs> exactly. That's exactly. what the, the gritty exactly. Happy Days reboot will be. Fonzie saying, "Get fucked." <laughs> <laughs> when they do the Riverdale version of Happy yeah. Days. Hey, there's like, be like sit and spin, <laughs> motherfucker. There's like a dramatic uh, a Fresh Prince of Bel Air show on now, so let's get the dramatic yeah. 
uh, gritty happy days. Yeah, they weren't all happy we, we days, Marge. Get, we can't get too sidetracked, but I am so curious. I'm so curious what the fuck that is. I assume it's like the Riverdale thing, but what is going on? I, what is happening? I heard it. I'd heard all right stuff about it, but yeah, I haven't. I haven't watched it yet either. I. Uh, it may be good. It's just baffling to it, me. I. I mean, you, hey, you got to remake something. You can't make a new thing. So you got to <laughs> remake something. You know. No, you're right. And, you're right. Well, I mean, honestly, I think about how uh, Many Saints of Newark just came out and I've been thinking to myself, like, if uh, <laughs> if if Tony Soprano's actor was still alive, they would just be making it like it would just be yeah. like they just do a new season. They would they would flush away all the thoughts of like, yeah, I know what you thought the ending of Sopranos was. Yeah. But you know what? We just decided that's not the ending. And so we're just making more of it. And Tony's it's old a now. terrible. It's a terrible truth. But there is something I don't know what to say, but there's something something uh, th- there's a bright side there's a, a silver lining to the, the tragedy of james gandolfini's death and that his most iconic and celebrated role cannot be fucked up by trying to do a cash grab on on the series it's true you know I mean, they did it anyway but not with him yes yeah with you know that many saints if they just didn't have christopher do the con that movie would be like 20 percent better if he wasn't doing voiceover in it i that's what i think i think i, I didn't see it i oh, didn't even really? know he was doing it yeah i, I was told it was pretty goofy the the one thing that um i respect i this isn't a totally original thought my friend was kind of saying this and i do respect it as well that chase has contempt for you know most fans of the show oh yeah and so what i've heard sorry if this is a spoil i haven't even seen it but i'm spoiling the movie um is that well i'm kind of spoiling is that at least the kind of narrative satisfaction at the end is centered around a black man who has nothing to do with the rest of the series and is his own character in this movie and it is emphatically not some kind of like you know fan service to how tough Italians have to stick together or whatever it's like the exact opposite of what all those guys would want and even though I don't think that justifies doing some shitty follow up to the Sopranos I like that he still has the hate in his heart and and put (laughs) that in this highly anticipated among that crowd highly anticipated sopranos send off that's pretty great that yes i i agree with that though i think it is there still is a lot of fan service in it a whole lot which hey i i was whooping it up at home of like ah junior finally said he doesn't have the makings of a college athlete like i love it like just so uh also though again i got so soprano pilled i'm now done rewatching sopranos bob so i'm not living sopranos as much (laughs) as i did but i when i think of these manhattans i was like oh yeah lately i had been just drinking like whiskey or cognac on the rocks straight because that that's how Tony drinks it in the show. I was like, yeah, I'm like Tony drinking my straight whiskey out of the, out of the glass. I'm such, I'm such a cool guy like Tony Spray. <laughs> You're going to get a tattoo, a, a really, really awful tattoo, like a photorealistic tattoo of James Gandolfini that says like respect is the, is family or whatever on, on you. Uh, man, why, why isn't anybody like Gary Cooper anymore? Well, whatever happened to Gary Cooper, that's why she get across my ch- heart. Yeah. But, Can I just say to get us, I, I think yeah. I ripped us off track. I love <laughs> Montaigne's, he's, he's doing it's that halted speech with with fat tony where it's like a very insightful way to because he could have just done the the joke and a lot of other characters is you know well absorbed and you know supoib and all that but his way of finding a funny way to personify those uh, mob guys where it's that kind of really sleazy halting dialogue it's a different episode where he goes you crack us so consistently up yeah, when he's talking to Krusty, like that's a really, really great way to have your your funny Simpsons mob guy sound. And apparently, he based the voice off of an uncle who has since passed away. But I believe that uncle got to sit in on a recording of him doing the voice, and the uncle really appreciated yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, lovely, that's lovely. Uh, and yeah, they they say that like Joe Montana, they love working with him. They say I I believe the famous LG line is if if Fat Tony sneezes, Joe Montana's playing it. Like he's gonna he does the sneeze. He uh, loves coming back. And then, uh, so Bart comes home, he tells his parents he's got a job, fixing drinks, picking horses, cutting cigars, you know, a job. Uh, (laughs) But uh, this again, I was like, oh, this is such perfect Homer. Like, this is, Marge is distrustful, but in an innocent way, and Homer is just shoveling ice cream out of the thing into (laughs) his mouth and just going like, what? Like, he doesn't care that he's in this episode, he doesn't give a shit. Like, so funny. And that line, I make more than that, is just 
is awesome. Yeah, I God, it's just and uh, and Bart's uh, thirty dollars a week would be worth sixty one dollars now, uh, according to an online inflation cal. He's okay. being shortchanged. <laughs> well, you know what? It's really a lot of tips. Uh, when he says thirty a week, right. I mean, you see, he's getting he's getting the tips. That's that's where the money's at. And yeah. then, so this sequence here, this is the good fella eist scene in in the whole thing. They uh, apparently they originally wanted "Be My Baby," which is a better song than "One Fine Day," yeah. but probably more expensive. Yeah, but well. it, that song wasn't in Goodfellas. Uh, Frosty no, the no. Snowman, the Ronette singing that was in Goodfellas. I think it's the only yes. Ronette song. You know, again, the Needle Drop soundtrack in Goodfellas like ruined movie soundtracks after that. Like everyone's like, oh, I can just put like back to back to back to back pop hits uh, that people will recognize and sets them in time. You know, it 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 like so many good things. You know, it created a subgenre that is ninety percent garbage um, <laughs> or or predictable crap. Uh, did you guys ever see the the guy E from Entourage made a movie? What was oh the Gotti movie? That's what I'm Gotti. Thinking of. Yep. Yeah. God damn! It's, that was I. I think I've I only seen clips. I've only seen clips. I think the marketing for that was basically reviewers don't want you to see it. They think you're stupid if you like it. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone's saying this movie is shitty and it sucks really bad. That means that the critics we touched a nerve. And everyone <laughs> actually wants to see. I remember. Sorry, this is, this is a gangster related show. I figure you know it's somewhat related. I went with some of my you know uh former colleagues will and felix to go to go see it and we were like making jokes on the way there about like respect but blah, blah, blah. it's all going to be about this really dumb version of like like we're saying like good fellas you know for toddlers it's all gonna be respect and family and, and new york my city and the movie opens it's like accordion music <laughs> Uh, there's like you know uh, Mulberry Street and John Travolta literally tur- he's at the he's on the river and he turns to the camera and says New York my fucking city it's about respect and we're just like <laughs> our, our minds are like melting that it's in the first five seconds it's everything we've just been making fun of that we didn't actually think was going to be in the first five seconds just YouTube like gaudy intro and you'll be overwhelmed and then you'll be overwhelmed if you Google also the ending where it's just like real footage of all these insane people uh, who love Gotti and like Staten Island being like he kept the city safe you know blah 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 <laughs> uh, um, that's... just watch Gotti actually is what I'm saying it shows you what movie Christopher Moltisanti would have made after Cleaver that's really what it would have been I guess another amazing Sopranos like self crit or um, just very very tactful way of, of of doing that I love the whole Cleaver plot it's pitch perfect uh, but yeah I mean these scenes are very similar to like just him training uh, in uh, in Henry Hill's training montage I guess I almost called it but uh, in Goodfellas of him uh, you know he gets handed some money he's just like I never see money like this everybody loves him like just it it's a great sequence to just explain wh- the, why people join the mafia, why people like it, why it's cool, why how they also indoctrinate a child to be their child soldier in in their group. You <laughs> yeah. Know? Yeah. Also, my guess is that one fine day, this is a cover song. I, my guess is the singer Sally Stevens because she's usually who they would hire to do mm. uh, a female cover. It was Kip Lennon if it was a man usually, and most famously, I think she sings the Scorpio song. Scorpio. Mm. Yeah, yeah. But uh, yes, and. And just like in, uh, you know, in Goodfellas too, uh, like they find money and like, hey, where'd you get this money? Eh, no, don't you, don't you worry, doll. <laughs> and uh, and also, yes, I did. So here's something I noticed for the first time, though. Among the nondescript mobsters, once the song's over, it goes to the itchy scratchy thing at the bar with the other mobsters watching it. There's a bald guy there who I think is just a pair. I think it's meant to look like Dan Castellaneta. I was thinking the same thing. Okay, good. He's You're an Italian same, guy. Yes. We know what he looks like. Let's draw him into. <laughs> the show i know that's that's what hey, I why not uh that's good all right i wish he kept showing up maybe maybe dan was like hey i don't like that yeah <laughs> uh, no absolutely the guy at the far end of the bar that's dan castellanetta 100 percent. yeah yeah uh, and, uh they do a line up against the wall in the itchy scratchy cartoon and just shoot them all <laughs> uh which i, I, I always, think is a real reference to a thing i always enjoy when the itchy and scratchy cartoons are just artless and bad it just wants in violence there's nothing clever about it but everyone still laughs yes yeah, the, the 
the bloody D through the guy is great. I, that's uh, yeah. and yes, uh, it being a bunch of guys lined up by a cop and then shot with Tommy guns. That is what happened in the St. Valentine's Day massacre in Chicago in 1929. Mm. Where, uh, yep. Two of the shoot uh, here's the from the wiki. Two of the shooters were wearing police uniforms while the other wore suits, ties, and overcoats. Uh, witnesses saw the men in police uniforms leading the other men at gunpoint out of the garage after the shooting. So there you go. That's that's why it's funny because it's true is uh it is literally true <laughs> but man that bloody d on the cat like it's so violent i i'm a little surprised they got away with it i mean i'm amazed they got away with most itchy and scratchy especially in the seasons to come i mean i don't know if they got you know more latitude after it became you know just sort of a, a darling but um it's it's insane what they get away with sometimes i i think also as a little kid i thought that champagne waterfall was so cool mm. i was like man that's nice i've never done it yet but uh i think i've been i feel like it in my video games press days i went to one fancy party once where somebody was doing it which uh but it, it always looks cool uh but yeah then black haired wiggum comes in he's uh this is yeah. maybe the last time he's got his season <laughs> one black hair on I think. Uh, another character they're figuring out because he is barely yeah. in season two because they're being very literal about who he is and what he does because they would think mm -hmm. why would the police chief be on all these routine calls why would he be working a beat he's behind his desk so we see him uh like running this investigation and that's why they find all the jokes with him before he is just like an authority figure in the world but now they can have fun and make him stupid mm -hmm, mm -hmm. it makes sense for wiggum to uh as police chief that he would get in on these busts because he thinks it's going to be like big headlines for him if he can arrest uh fat tony but I, they've realized i think with this episode how funny it is for him to just be with the other cops on any old arrest and so like you know what he just have him be there it, it can't just be lou eddie and lou going to the people's house <laughs> And he's his voice talking about voices again. Like it's a little more. It's still that sort of Edward G. Robinson. It's more faithful. Not, it's not the complete like almost pig like voice that he eventually gets. Um, and is a little bit more goofy and and flanderized. I guess is the I, term. I love his line. Until one of us is behind bars you mm -hmm. like you <laughs> uh and i feel like you know he takes his free drink but i feel like you know by another season wiggum will just be directly taking bribes and not not even yes. pretending to want to arrest fat tony <laughs> that's another thing is they develop the you know both uh, socially astute and comically superior role for him as a corrupt cop and that he's just basically never solving crimes and when he's even approached about it he's dismissing someone and busy either eating or taking a bribe yeah he does sound a bit more like uh the initial impression for hank azaria was uh, david brinkley mm -hmm. and then it transitioned to edward uh, as edward or edgar i always mess that up oh i think edward g robinson. edward edward g edward. robinson i love the man uh double indemnity great movie but and that's uh, like most started out as al pacino and then morphed into his own thing so uh, hank is having fun like evolving these voices and uh, i also yes. love the way fat tony says to him good for you like that's yeah. such a great condescending <laughs> <laughs> yeah okay then uh this cigarette scene again this is like homer perfection like this is schwarzwelder <laughs> really getting homer at the level of stupidity that's perfect for him and this is this in another scene after this are so perfect of like homer thinks he's in a regular sitcom and will not notice how how, how much bigger things are on him now <gasps> bart have you started smoking? No. Don't lie to me, boy. Uh-huh. Cigarettes, <laughs> just as I thought. They're not mine. My boss said his warehouse was full. Yeah, right. Son, I'm going to teach you a lesson. <clears throat> I'm going to stand here and watch you smoke every one of those cigarettes. Then maybe you'll learn. Uh, Fat Tony sent me over to pick up the goods. Right in here, my man. Hey, kid, you look good with that cigarette. Kind of sophisticated. <laughs> Son, I'll <laughs> never doubt you again. <laughs> Bart was using the old I'm holding it for a friend lie, but in that case it's yep. true. He oh, actually is. So great. The way Homer goes, yeah, right. And then uh, the, I laughed so hard this time when Homer has a clearly labeled carton of cigarettes in front of him. <laughs> and when he opens the carton and pulls out one pack, he's like, aha, cigarettes, just as I thought. Like, what a <laughs> yep. great, great line. There's a mountain of, I guess, all hand-drawn, yeah. as they say in the commentary, background. Homer 
Homer has stacked, to squeeze past them. <laughs> There's so many. <laughs> I wish they yeah. explained what is written on the back of that guy's jacket. Uh, you see the patch on his uh, shoulder is like an okay symbol, and there's like a joke mm. company name written on the back of his oh, jacket. Yeah. But you don't actually get to see the entire thing, and I wish they would have said what it was. Is uh, that a, his voice? I You know, I can't see the video when you're playing the clip. I, I don't remember if he... Does he look like a returning character, or is he just that voice that they sometimes use? It is the Bronson voice, but it's yeah. not the Raphael design, as we've learned his okay. name is in season 12. Yeah. yeah. Oh, oh, interesting. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I, I love that voice. And I love uh, I love that line. Kind of sophisticated. Yeah. What a great thing to tell the kids at home. <laughs> like, yeah, you look sophisticated. They slip that in. Like, that's flagrantly <laughs> telling people it's or telling kids it's cool to smoke. I also love that Homer says, I'll ne like that he trusts Bart entirely now. And then when it cuts to Bart filing his nails while sitting on the couch, while well, meanwhile, Homer has the blank expression on his face with a beer in his hand like he is not <laughs> thinking at all when he sees all this stuff like he he has no thoughts on bart and lisa right in front of him talking about like hey is, is your boss a mobster <laughs> he doesn't care homer does not give a shit in this episode yeah this is the end of press conference wig i'm like i guess he still mm -hmm. hosts press conference after this but like you said bob in, in season one and two that's mainly what wiggum does he's he's a press conference guy on tv by the end of the season he's returning mag to Homer after she goes missing. So right, right. He really takes a journey down to like beat cop level <laughs> activities. Uh, and and it's so great that to assure the smokers, he just lets the Laramie representative come up and just do a commercial on TV for cigarettes. He'll be, is this the one that. where they, they'll be ignoring all stop signs and crosswalks? <laughs> yes, that's so good. <laughs> and that's uh, Jack Larson. One of his two appearances, he'll he's the also the guy uh, in charge of Laramie in uh, the Lisa Beauty Queen episode. Oh. I wish he appeared more. He's a great slime ball character like he's great yeah but yeah we hear that that this would not stay the same even in uh classic era simpsons episodes but i really love this name of uh fat tony his real name police suspect the involvement of reputed mobster william fat tony williams fat tony is a cancer on this fair city he is the cancer and i am the uh <laughs> what cures cancer Bart, is your boss a crook? I don't think so. Although it would explain an awful lot. <laughs> Me and the boys wish to thank you for hanging on to this stuff for us. Thanks. Uh, say, are you guys crooks? Bart, um, I is it wrong to steal a loaf of bread to feed your starving family? No. Well, suppose you got a large starving family. Is it wrong to steal a truckload of bread to feed them? Uh-uh. And what if your family don't like bread? They like cigarettes. I guess that's okay. Now, what if instead of giving them away, you sold them at a price that was practically giving them away? Would that be a crime, Bart? Hell no. Enjoy your gift. <laughs> That's so great. He so directly describes a crime to Bart, and Bart goes like, "Hell no!" Like, that's so good. I it's he's a good he's a good, he's a good salesman. He's a persuasive guy. And, uh, you know, in many Saints of Newark, there's a very similar scene of this, of not to this extent, but of Dickie Moltisanti explains to a young Tony Soprano how you compartmentalize things and just say to yourself, like, oh, well, just tell yourself this is the last time I steal anything like this. Just tell yourself that and you do it. Yeah, I just love Bart's. Oh, that would explain an awful lot. And also his his reaction shot is, again, just great little animation there. You As know? he's using the Embry board. <laughs> yes. Yeah. <laughs> I wish they'd have stuck with it, but I mean, he, his later name would be Fat Tony D'Amico, but that his name is William Williams, which, you know, <laughs> if in the world of the mafia, he would instantly be called like Billy Will or Will, Bill, Will, Willie Will or something Big like Bill, Big Bill, uh, any type of name that would have to do with such a perfect name as Willie Will, William Williams. But then they call him Fat Tony. Like there's a story there. I just love there's an untold story there of how he got that name. So I didn't realize that they changed his name. That's. that's that's too bad. Was yeah. that was that when he reappears in uh, Homie the Clown, or is that even later? I he... believe it is in Homer. They the Homer they fall in season eight. Oh, okay. He's uh, Michael Buffer okay. interviews uh, introduces him as Fat Tony D'Amico. Hmm. Uh, yeah, that's sort of stepping away from a a joke because like D'Amico isn't a joke. That's just an Italian name. Why you know like it's I, I get that they that it would scan you know more 
easily for people but don't don't get don't get rid of your funny joke it's more of a bill and josh thing of just like well what's a boring name for? yeah <laughs> like what is a boring but uh, unknown uh italian name like uh, D'Amico. let's go with that uh and yeah you know the stealing of the cigarettes uh and reselling them that is what uh henry hill gets in trouble for the start of goodfellas so again yep. <laughs> with the miniature Joe Pesci, he does it. That's right. Yeah, and he gra- and it's his graduation day, just like Bart. He's uh, you know he he stayed strong selling the cigarettes, and that's when he gets his suit. It's funny that again, yeah. the things they they borrow directly are not the most memorable things from the movie. They do the "you look like a gangster" moment with Marge and a Bart, but yeah. I get which you know is a memorable moment, but not n- nobody repeats "you look like a gangster." Although, frankly, Goodfellas is so chock full of quotable and or memorable moments that it's a, it's one of those movies where you can just take your pick. You know, mm. there's so many good things, but I like that they didn't. I guess it was so contemporaneous that maybe they didn't even know what was going to be yeah totally memeified at the time <laughs> although you're probably right the joe pesci stuff was was obviously you know the the thing everyone was tapping into but i yeah i wish that they uh you know i wish a lot of things about the later seasons but like <laughs> it's 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 refreshing that they're they're not going for those easy with those low hanging fruits it's kind of that that's what you would want them to do is eschew that but then as we talked about last time you know by the time they're doing say the the in sync episode it's like matrix gag you know where they're flying in the air like all the stuff that is nine months late mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. you know in general this is like the opposite of that which is kind of interesting bart asked for three fingers of milk which is a kid i had to, my mom had to explain to me that that is a an old timey measurement of alcohol that it goes up to the height your fingers this is another just great very schwarzwelder scene of marge being like well, i'm a little worried but about something entirely ridiculous <laughs> i know it's good for a boy to have a part-time job but i'm not sure about the people bart's working for i think they're criminals a job's a job i mean take me if my plant pollutes the water and poisons the town by your logic that would make me a criminal well bart's been acting very strangely And that pizza delivery truck has been parked across the street for two weeks. How long does it take to deliver a pizza? Looks like our cover's blown. Let's roll. (laughs) See? It was all your imagination. Homer, I want you to go down to that club and talk to them. Let's see what kind of people they are. Please, homie. Oh, all right. Hmm. Flowers by Irene. What great! I, but I mean, that. that's that also does feel like a good fellas parody because like that film perfectly captures the feeling of like, wait, is that is that helicopter? Is that it? Is that it? Like just that uh, yeah. paranoia. Yeah. Uh, and he also just I love Homer's like by your logic that would make me a criminal. <laughs> <laughs> Homer is ready for yeah. the internet. It's true. <laughs> yeah. Also, just as the car drives away, as Marge was saying that, Homer goes, see, it was all your imagination. Like, what a great, shitty Homer, it's like jerk Homer line. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, uh, and yeah, so Homer, I guess Homer made a few hundred bucks winning that uh, that card game that they let him win. I guess that's part of their bribery, which this is, uh, you know, similar to, uh, well, actually, they, they get a little more direct with the, the mafia getting involved in a, in a boy's life thing from, from Goodfellas. But I think it works fine. Them saying, Homer, you're a hell of a father and just Homer being satisfied, that works enough. Like, I think Al Jean was second guess- guessing things too much of like, no, we need it. We need a some scene of homer and marge resolving that homer's not worried about it anymore and so they just take out the ending shot from lisa's substitute and put new dialogue over Mm. it i I don't i don't know do you guys think it's needed like there are some things in here uh that aren't needed i think they're still thinking in the old way of writing the show uh being too literal trying to justify things the scene coming up with burns and smithers i feel like they're trying to justify a crazy choice they would just let happen at the end of the season yeah but yeah yeah, again i think you're totally right about that henry I think, uh, you know, I, we talk about, I fear that Al Jean second guesses himself too much in his later era of the show, but I, I think yeah, a little of that even is in, in the classic seasons like this, but, and then also, I, we, I agree with you, Bob. I, I think it's, it's just sort of like a, a transitory thing where they're moving out of an old style of formal conflict resolution or plot where like beating out stuff that they would <laughs> certainly go on to at times 
go out of their way to ignore those things but here they're still somewhat tailored to them and uh, they then call back to bart the genius with an i am the wiener i am a wiener spray painting of of (laughs) of skinner on the wall i like that bart tries to bribe him and uh, that he he just completely rejects this very very similar to to henry hill getting a beating at home when his uh uh, school narks on him that he's he's not been to school in months and yep uh, except in this case they don't beat uh, they don't beat up a postman. No, they try to have a very nice meeting with Skinner. Yes. And yeah. he's the aggressive one, which I, I love that twist coming up. Uh, yeah. So uh, so Bart has to stay for detention and uh, right on the chalkboard. We then cut to the big uh, mafia meeting. This is the most like direct Godfather 2 ni- stuff in the episode. Not not only the kiss of death, but that Hartman is absolutely parodying Frankie Five Angels, uh, the actor Michael Gazzo from Michael uh, Gazzo. Godfather Part 2, which, what have I done to that? Like, what? <laughs> yeah. When I finally watched Godfather Part Two after seeing this as a kid, I was like, "Oh, that's the <laughs> that's why everybody talks with his raspy voice." What I do for for that's very good. Actually, that's really good, Henry. I'm, um, a, I'm a master of voices. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, w- for Blowback Season Two, little little shameless plug: we uh, did a movie episode about bad movies made about Cuba, and one of them was kind of like a sleazy, um, you know, almost trauma level film called. Well, it had two titles. One was actually. It's, Funnily enough, one of them was Sweet Dirty Tony, <laughs> and it was the name of it. The other one was called Cuba Crossing, a little bit more boring. But Michael Gazzo is in that, like in the later part of his career, probably not that much later. But uh, the, the things that make that a strong voice and performance in the Godfather movies make it incredibly grating and hard to <laughs> deal with in, in any other not very good movie. But yes, that's a, the, this is definitely a Godfather uh, direct like Godfather reference here. That, that's a great episode of your podcast with Bill Corbett on it. That's yeah, Bill Corbett one. from Mystery yeah. Science Theater, I should say. Yeah, go check it out if you want to hear about bad Cuba cinema. And so, uh, yes, they they give the uh, job of mixing Manhattans to Louie instead, and, well, doesn't go so well. So, Fat Tony, you invite me and my associates to your club with the promise of the finest Manhattans in all of Springfield. Now you say your bartender isn't here? I don't know what happened. He's never late. Louis, make up some Manhattans. But I only know how to make wine spritzes. Oh. What have I done to deserve this <laughs> flat, flavorless Manhattan? <laughs> The kiss of death. That's all I need. <laughs> you know, credit to Phil Hartman. Whenever I see a Manhattan on a menu, I think of him saying that. <laughs> you don't want to dry flavorless Manhattan. It's worth it's worth killing over if you're given a crappy Manhattan. <laughs> and a white wine spritzer, or sorry, a wine spritzer is just wine and soda water. It's yeah, just like anyone can do this. <laughs> it's what got it's what got Ned wasted. That's right. Uh the the wussy you love spritzers. Yeah. They the mafia does love them. It's, uh, it's funny, but it's also it's also true. <laughs> <laughs> it's just is the way he walks off I, it also uh the guy playing jacks like that feels like a very Schwarzwelder script direction kind of thing too <laughs> uh and so yes the the monsters uh, you know fortunately for fat tony he is not killed over this and he, he continues to live in the series but uh, this is not don victorio dimaggio i would guess behind the scenes this phil hartman voice guy gets replaced uh and taken over usurped or by don wax. victorio oh yes yeah <laughs> <laughs> and uh so yes bart then uh you know tells them that it's because uh principal skinner made him stay like oh well really <laughs> this again very quick scene but their confrontation with skinner this is such perfect skinner here oh you are late for work of course i'm late for work how can i be on time when principal skinner keeps me after school this guy skinner causing you trouble he sure is patron hmm perhaps we should go to meet and greet this individual Come on, boys. Some large men to see you, sir. (laughs) I don't have an appointment with any large men. (laughs) You, Skinner. I'm Principal Skinner, yes. And how, may I ask, did you get past the hall monitors? 
That's good. That's just <laughs> one the... of one of the top five lines, uh, maybe of of Skinner in general for me. I don't have an appointment with any large. There, oh, there's large uh, so much great lighting in this episode for no reason. Skinner is just sitting in a dark room. So when yeah. the door opens, it's like noir lighting spread across him, like uh, this this big like. Maybe he's stripe. having a, a a Vietnam flashback. <laughs> like such such a great little cut there too of like oh you this man's murdered like this is the assumption you're jumping to there and just though though. His secretary would be a witness to the murder. I guess they're going to escort him out and kill him somewhere else. That's the yeah, never go to a second location. Yes, that you're right. You're right. I, oh, and a little thing I meant to mention too. Another little tiny thing I love animation wise is when Fat Tony is watching his boss drink. Like he kind of purses his lips out of like that. He's mm-hmm. that, that's how much he's like. Oh, what's what's he th- drinking? Like what a great little thing. Like uh, so good. Uh, but yes, this is when uh, in the very next scene, Enda Krabappel comes in crying. She's more emotional than usual in this episode and they're planting the seeds that will blossom uh, yeah. years later yeah. and uh, this is when she announces to the kids that he's missing all the kids yell in, in excitement even Martin which feels you know and Martin shouldn't be he should be concerned about <laughs> he this. shouldn't he shouldn't yeah <laughs> I for a second in my head thought is this the because it's one of my favorite scenes is this is this when skinner is cracking open the door and says a boking accident like i was just <laughs> you know uh, uh, crossing my wires but it it did remind me that this is not the last time poor seymour skinner is going to have a run-in with the mob although i guess the second time he actually is successfully captured and, and tortured <laughs> they get directly violent with him in that one yes yeah <laughs> yeah yeah he's not as stern i guess he's his spirit has been whittled down by that point and they actually successfully get the better of him uh so the next act of the episode begins with uh, Wiggum starting the search. Uh, he, you know, he has the most advanced scientific techniques in the field of body finding. I also like uh, just a great gag of them fishing the scuba diver out and then Skinner <laughs> having to look at the picture of Seymour first to be sure it's not him. <laughs> Uh, and w- Willie talks to the media and then we get our, uh, one of two appearances by Princess Opal. I, I wish this fortune teller appeared more in the series. And She's hey, funny. Speaking of like uh, finding characters and characters emerging, Willie returning from his first appearance. Yeah, you're right. The yeah. second yeah. speaking appearance. First return. Yeah. Wow. Uh, last seen in uh, Principal Charming in mid season two, they assumed they would never use him again. Right. But here he is. Man. Yeah. I I, I, I guess I always think of season three as when things took a step up as far as the, the style and the tone, but I didn't realize that so many signature characters had only appeared once or twice until that season. And it was also like a universe building thing as well. Yeah, the break between two and three, I think, gave them the real, the, the writers, a real chance to appraise like, well, we saw what worked and what didn't in uh, pretty much every episode would have been done by then, or at least in, in some level of completion. So they could say, like, oh, well, this, this is the thing that works better. Like, let's, and, and, and Will, he's very funny once we finally see his ridiculous look and crazy face. Uh, but say, I wish they thought Princess Opal was as funny because she, I mean, her one joke is in this episode and there's not much more to it but uh her, let, let, let's hear some of her predictions please i can assure you we'll be using the most advanced scientific techniques in the field of body finding i see wedding bells for vanna white and teddy kennedy please princess opal if we could just stick to principal skinner chief wiggum i am merely a conduit for the spirits oh <gasps> Willie Nelson will astound his fans by swimming the English Channel. Really? Willie Nelson? (laughs) (laughs) He loved fire drills. (laughs) Will you get a hold of yourself, lass, for the wee balance? Hey, look at me. I'm Skinner's body. That is not funny, Lewis. Well, I heard Skinner's buried under his parking spot. Well, I heard he was ground up into hamburger and served to us at lunch. I heard Bart and Skinner killed by gangsters. That's not true. It's just a rumor. You're engaged in speculation. I know the law. You can't prove anything. I, I love how Wiggum easily so, gets on board with just being entertained by these celebrity predictions. Yeah. Just like, oh, really? Wow. Oh, <laughs> uh, Brendan, sorry. That's a that's a flash of, of future Wiggum a bit there, like just suddenly suddenly being bamboozled. Um, <laughs> so here's a question. Are we are we to think that Nelson, maybe from his being on the wrong side of the law, of elementary school law at least, that's how he actually is savvy to Bart's involvement? Or is that just purely a gag like that could have been any kid coming mm. up with the exact 
uh, right answer for where Skinner has probably gone. You know, if it was Milhouse saying it, that'd be another thing. But yeah, I think you're right that this is the bad kid saying mm-hmm. it. Maybe he has a little intel, you know? Maybe, maybe Nelson's I, I wouldn't with have the thought mo- about it except that it's Nelson. Like, it's <laughs> Nelson for presumably for a reason. Maybe it's not. I, I think know. so, yeah. You know, with his name Munz, then he must be in with like a German gang, a German <laughs> immigrant gang as well. <laughs> but yeah, he's, uh, he's, well, and, and Nelson's, does Nelson have a dad? Was his dad like dad? Oh, he's got a couple dad. Yeah. There's two different okay. versions of Nelson's dad. His, his dad has a lot of lore. His dad appears at the beginning of uh, Brother from the Same Planet as the soccer coach. Uh, and, right. Yeah, he picks Nelson. And yeah, I remember that. And then he disappears. And then much later in the teens, I believe, they do the return of Nelson's dad. Mm-hmm. And then he was instead a deadbeat dad who like abandoned his mom for her uh, addiction to cough syrup, I believe it was. <laughs> and uh and yeah you know yeah teddy kennedy gone but vanna white as big a star as ever on on wheel of fortune every night everybody everybody loves her <laughs> did you see that clip the other day of the people not getting uh another feather in in your cap that made yeah me go that, insane that was uh that's really that's the point of wheel of fortune is to drive you insane not to feel it's you know you watch jeopardy you feel dumber than the competitors if you watch wheel of fortune <laughs> you're supposed to feel smarter than mm-hmm. them it's the, that's why it's a great yeah. combo of shows no that uh i think that what's so funny in that clip was in the feather in your cap one there's one guy who definitely knows it and twice he yeah. hits bankrupt so he can't guess it and so it, has, yeah, it keeps awesome. going to the two idiots who don't know it. <laughs> yeah it's- the Simpsons Great. did uh, did this did that joke like last season three loins in the fountain that's right that's instead of right. three coins in the fountain so even back then they were aware of how frustrating that was <laughs> Yeah, uh, yeah the, that's great. The timelessness of uh, Wheel of Fortune. It's uh, but... Pat Sajak. Also, I'm I'm surprised he hasn't like gone on a, a rant that will get his career uh, cut short because he's a big right winger. Yeah, Pat isn't Sajak. that funny that like the he's he it always feels like he's about to be on the Chuck Woolery level, but I think yeah he's got some handlers who are just able to keep him at like the Chris Pratt level of acceptable famous Republican. <laughs> you know, just I mean I mean that's if there ever was a golden goose for a man of pat sajak's talent it's like don't screw with the wheel of fortune gig just <laughs> his handlers yeah exactly they, they they must be begging him to not to not go there they, he's not going to implode like gina carano you know he's he's smart he knows where the money's at but <laughs> exactly also man that slap on edna like it's like uh, i think it's actually very well animated like the way it is but it's intense to see willie just slap i mean it's like from a 1940s movie which is why swartz put putting yeah, exactly. it in there like mm-hmm. you slap a hysterical exactly. woman that's what you do not in front of the bairns yeah. yeah the bairns yeah but i i also it's i i do find it funny when the kid is like look i'm skinner's body it's just such a funny thing for like like even a fourth grader to be making fun of it's just like i'm our principal's corpse yeah. you know isn't this fun guys it's, it's a great so observable smart. kid thing that they'd be like oh i'll pretend to be a decapitated body by putting <laughs> uh leaves over my head I, like that's such a funny thing that that and bart ripping his pants are the juvenile uh bits of the episode that i genuinely really laughed hard at and uh, then we have a very season one thing of a minute long dream sequence like and i think it is executed perfectly like so many great like animation bits here like not not a ton of great lines though, a couple but yeah yeah, just like Bart coming across zombie Skinner in so many different mm-hmm. spots, like so good. And the, the meat locker Skinner, that's how Frank dies. Yeah. In the uh in Goodfellas. I mean he's in a truck, ah, but yes. there's there's meat hanging. Yeah, it's the meat hanging that which again that has to I'm not saying, you know, people weren't the bodies weren't left on meat hooks in other movies before that but him being a frozen body in a meat locker is in his suit is a good fellas reference there's no two ways about that a good another good version of that i believe is road games if anyone wants uh a, a lesser known classic stacy keach hmm. who was in Gotti, in a much better film with jamie lee curtis <laughs> called road games where uh, a killer puts a bunch of people in a i think a, a freezer truck with with hooks Ooh. um earlier than good fellas yeah i was gonna say the shot of Skinner coming out of the of the locker is so squiggly it almost reminded me of home movies oh, <laughs> like a, it could have been a frame from home movies there it was uh, it was approaching squiggle vision levels <laughs> yeah exactly exactly <laughs> and uh, then there's a great design of where Bart's in jail in the death house in big neon like that's so great love that and love that and, and Bob's got it as his background but Homer chanting kill my boy what a great <laughs> with, with no real lip sync just yeah. like oh, oh. <laughs> that's that's something 
something that in this season, as much as they're getting Homer in the show, is still a dream sequence. In a couple of seasons, that would just be taking place in reality. Homer yes. would just get swept up and then actually be advocating <laughs> everyone to kill his son. Homer sort of becomes this uh, kind of uh, character in court when he turns on Bart, though. Like, oh, it's all true. Yeah. In a way, he does that's kill another, Bart. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yes. That's, that, that, that's another. I guess I'll, I will wait for it. But that is another one of my favorite lines in this episode coming in that scene. Uh, and I love Love Joy uh, in Bart's dream comforting him with, they're there. They're there. <laughs> they're there. And Bart being electrocuted is kind of funny, but I, but the Deep Deep Trouble music video does animate Bart being sent to the electric chair a little funnier, so it's hard for me not to think of that as a, as a better bit. But but they had a bigger budget. It was music video budget on that. I, I understand why. But Bart's jump out of bed and scream, that's great. I... I know they say it on the commentary, but I don't think so. I mean, okay, yes. A guy screaming and then a cut to an establishing shot of a house. That is a Godfather horsehead reference, but they do so much more explicit horsehead jokes, like 17 of them, it feels like, in the history of the series. There's one just around the corner, too, with Lisa's Pony. Maybe after they, like, halfway do it in this episode, once they get to Lisa's Pony, they're like, let's go all the way. Let's just go all the way with the horsehead bit. Uh, And so Bart comes in uh, early for work in this next scene you're eight hours early for work i like that did you kill my principal uh chinese guy with a mustache no my principal that skinner guy no we didn't kill him nobody more you're all under arrest for the murder of seymour skinner what's a murder don't play <laughs> dumb with me <laughs> cuff him boy oh bart why couldn't you have gotten a paper rule like other boys? Wait till I get you home, boy. What's that guy doing here? Lionel Hutz, court-appointed attorney. I'll be defending you on the charge of murder one. Wow, even if I lose, I'll be famous. <laughs> oh. You know, not enough of Hutz being a bad lawyer, uh, but he wasn't as crazy as he would be at this point in the show. Yeah, but this is them getting him. Like, yeah. they, this again, when, when Bill and Josh, I think, especially write him so well in their season four episodes, but they're referencing really how he's written in this one more than in, uh, yep. in the previous part gets bit, but hit by a car. Yeah. Yeah, because, I mean, there's... There's not a lot of screen time for him, but murder one. And uh, at the end where he goes, uh, do I still get paid? Yeah. It's like classic, classic huts. I also really laughed hard this time in Homer saying, wait till I get you home, boy, because this is him thinking he's in a season one episode where it's like, you, you're you not taking Bart home. He's in jail for <laughs> denied bail. Like, this is bad. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Chinese guy with a mustache. I choose to believe that's a reference to the Cassavetes mm. mobster film the killing of a chinese bookie that's what i the guy it must be it must be i do believe the guy who gets shot in the hot tub in that movie does have a mustache Hmm. who's uh Mm -hmm. the spoilers in that film a chinese bookie is killed but that's not really the plot of the (laughs) film it's it's a pretty aimless movie in a cassavetti's way but i i like it but uh and this the scene with uh, burns and smithers uh they love burns and smithers they want to work them into everything at this point in the show but it feels like they feel the next idea is so crazy they need to have a character comment on like can you believe it smithers they're doing this yeah it's it's actually Three. Though it feels weird for Burns <laughs> to be the guy who's like, people are yeah. too crazy with the the uh, trying children as adults. Which boy, this is a depressed. This was a depressing thing to search, guys. Guess what? There's been several people since this Simpsons episode who were uh, 12 or 13 or 11 uh, tried for first degree murder in America, mm. and uh, they uh, uh, the four stories I could find when I searched the wonderful search term of youngest person first degree murder, they were all in 1999 these these wow. uh, three three cases one uh, one of the cases had two defendants 112 113 another 11 in 1999 two of them were in florida one was in michigan and uh yeah it's depressing and i uh i bet you guys can guess a unifying similarity in all four of these people who were tried as adults despite being children in america Mm. i I bet you can guess yes they're all african-american that's that that is the reason like yes (laughs) they they are tried as like they're horrible stories you can look them up if you want to but it's just tragic 
things of people that failed the system like yeah uh so unfortunately when burns jokes that like could you believe this would happen in america like no it, it happens all it happened all the time i guess for that reason alone there's a bit of added value you know social commentary to what was otherwise kind of like an unnecessary little shot yeah yeah it's uh, I, uh though though now you see now it's uh it's so routine like those lawyers didn't become famous <laughs> but uh yeah 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 though i suppose if they were white children like bart maybe so yeah i Perhaps think so, so instead of no it's I mean, funny that i i was i was watching it and i i didn't know that was reused but it was it's kind of like subconsciously i did like i didn't even remember that scene with smithers and burns i just sort of it it it, it felt so uh, like tangential i i forgot that was even in the episode so i don't even remember what they said I was thinking, uh, speaking of minors being tried for murder, uh, Kyle Rittenhouse, did his lawyers become famous or were they already famous? Mm, yeah, I think it was the famous lawyers already. Okay. And he is, he's certainly on the touring ticket. Uh, he's touring around too. Well, that well, that's a difference too because uh, he was found not guilty as opposed to all the people I mentioned there, they were found guilty. Uh, some of them, one of them went to jail for five years and then was released on appeal. Two of them went to jail for 15 years and were released in 2014 in insane to me and again 12 and 13 i just i mean you know yeah. even, even even in the cases like where it is an open and shut case of of guilt in that like they're they're children this is not i yep. uh, uh, i like well, it's a bummer i don't want to talk about it anymore, <laughs> but but yes and okay. they're definitely not put in the same cell with adults no uh, <laughs> it's certainly not with a giant buff sideshow bob as well which honestly looks uh, it looks like someone's oh, yeah. fetish art honestly of like <laughs> which like, is also weird because the, that that you know, Bart and him are not nemesis yet. It's kind of a strange. I'm sure they were. Obviously, they didn't know that that was all going to un, un, unspool the way it did. But it's yeah, it's weird. It's a weird moment just because of what we know will happen. Yeah, when he comes back in Black Widower, Bart's like, "We were sellies, right? Yeah, Remember?" Yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, does, no, he sure doesn't reference it. No, no he doesn't really reference gone. it. No. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. uh, but uh, but yes, after a brief clip of uh, brush with greatness uh, and Burns and Smithers talking, uh, it's then uh, people take to the stand. Also, pretty similar to the end of Goodfellas, of Fat Tony is basically Henry Hill on the stand, pointing at uh, right. the, pointing at his boss. Except he he points at Bart. I didn't order this Skinner guy killed. But aren't you the head of this gang? No, I just stopped by the club occasionally to read the complimentary newspaper. <laughs> then who is the kingpin, the capo di tutti capi? That's the guy. Ooh. Hey! Forgive me, Don Bartholomew. <laughs> we tried to stop the kid, but he wouldn't quit. It was like you went crazy. Prostitution, loan shocking, numbers. <laughs> the kid liked the wet his week and everything. <laughs> Mr. Simpson, you've been the boy's father for 10 years. Do you really think he could be the leader of a murderous criminal syndicate? Well, not the leader, I mean. <laughs> oh, it's true, it's true, all the pieces fit. <laughs> Now, if this was uh, real life, you Bart would never forgive his father ever for doing this to him. <laughs> uh, the, the I really just think that is um, one of my favorite Homer lines is not the leader. Like, <laughs> you know, of course, he's probably mixed up in organized crime, but he's not. He's not that bad. I, I, I that's just perfectly delivered. It's also funny hearing blue haired lawyers say capo di tutti capi like such a <laughs> yeah. Guy. And there's a there's a fun little inside joke that's on the commentary. Uh, Rich Moore talks about the uh, the bad sketch the artist is drawing of Bart. Apparently that was a Bart that someone had drawn for them in a submission packet to work on the show. <laughs> oh my God! I mean, even the the effort, like the attention to put in that gag at the time, it's like every possible opening you know they would use even though no one like it's only because i listened to the commentary and or appeared on the show that i would ever learn that but it's cool that they did that just them taking a swipe at an artist who like probably <laughs> at home was like wait what they do that though i i'm also surprised that the fox lawyers kept that in there because it almost sounds like a True. lawyer would be like this is might open us up to a lawsuit of, of us like this artist could sue that we used his art without paying him <laughs> 
That's an interesting point. I, I yeah, I, I guess they got lucky maybe, but uh, yeah, they didn't shout out the artist's name and say, "Hey, this guy sucks." Yeah, so, that's you know. true. <laughs> and uh, and also another inside joke: Fat Tony's prison number eight F O three. That's the episode code for the production of this mm. one. So yeah, they show the chart with Bart at the top. Uh, it was a Godfather reference, but now I can't not think of Sopranos that has a very sure. prominent chart in it as well. When when with the, uh, uh, with the uh, song by um, Exhibit. Yeah. Yes. (laughs) And you know, when he, when legs wipes his nose and says, uh, wet his beak and everything, that's the bit where it really reminded me of Tony, uh, Cicero slash, uh, Polly Walnuts. That's the, that's the one. But, uh, I also love the, in the newspaper, the editorial drawing of Bart is like the standard oil, uh, octopus holding everything (laughs) in his tentacles. That's so great too. Yeah. (laughs) After I've read all those depressing stories about actual children, um, in court, seeing tiny little bard in chains with a with the the judge looking above him a little less funny to me it's it's just more tragic <laughs> but but it's a great drawing mm-hmm. and yes his yep. bart is about to be sentenced uh skinner reveals himself <gasps> principal skinner i thought he was dead i suppose you're all wondering where i've been it all started a week ago <laughs> I was at my desk revising and updating the school dress codes when I was suddenly confronted by a gang of toughs acting on behalf of one Bart Simpson. Or so they said. We really think there's promise in a boy. Get out! Okay, okay, you don't have to yell. (sighs) To get my mind off that ugly confrontation, I went home and began bundling my old newspapers. But suddenly the pile fell. (laughs) I was trapped. Let this be a lesson to recycle frequently. For the next week, I stayed alive by eating my mother's delicious preserves and maintained my sanity by dribbling a nearby basketball with my one free hand. I made a game of it, seeing how many times I could bounce the ball in a day and then trying to break that record. Occasionally, the police arrived to search my home. Find anything this time, boys? Nah, no sign of it, Chief. Princess Opal? I see nothing here, but I'm afraid it's Splitsville for Delta Burke and Major Dad. But they seem so happy. <laughs> I oh, la- Bob, yeah. every time you say that makes me laugh. We so we, much. we checked in on it last time, but it's it's true this time as well. Uh, Gerald McRaney and Delta Burke happily married since 1989. Take that, you know. All these people thought, I hey, I wouldn't bet on any Hollywood marriage lasting, <laughs> any single one. And uh, to put us to put us in the early 90s, we get references to Major Dad and MacGyver. Yes, yeah. This this uh, they you know we talk about it a ton in the later seasons in the teens, but this is so true for this. Like they say that this came in pretty late uh in in the third act writing and it actually is like such a it is a very simpsony thing of they have written themselves into a corner but there's the only logical explanation is skinner is definitely dead and murdered by the mafia and so he has to then explode into the room and it becomes a completely different episode and just a <laughs> lengthy parody of a macgyver <laughs> series they, and they had a real uh bone to pick with macgyver which was at this point entering its final season like yeah. it would be a plot point in black widower uh patty and selma defined as macgyver fans and richard <laughs> dean anderson would even appear on the show in 2006 patty and selma hold him hostage in the episode kiss kiss bang bangalore and of course we all know this best through the parody mcgruber of course but there was a macgyver reboot it ran for 100 episodes from 2016 to 2021 i think they were trying to take it back from mcgruber unbelievable to yeah me, man Which well because is- mcgruber it's really just the name he doesn't do macgyvery things that's that's true. I, I love that movie. I, I don't know if the new show is is good. I'm I'm sure it rules. It rules. If you if you love the movie, watch the new show. It rules. Okay. Yeah. I was like, stu- the movie is one of those movies where like there's no reason this should be good. You know, it's like it should be like a passable SNL spinoff movie. But Will Fort is just so amazing, and they get an amazing cast. But the, the name is almost misleading because he's not a MacGyver parody. Right. It's but just yeah, the uh, uh, it's just the aesthetic, right? The MacGyver aesthetic. Yeah. And. It could be any 80s action hero, uh, though, I, I think as well. It's I just think like uh, like Decker at the end of the movie, he does one thing MacGyvery. He MacGyvers together one thing. I, but yeah, the as as the sketches were invented, it was MacGyver is about to put a shoelace with a piece of gum or whatever, but then he acts stupid and gets distracted by it. They go like, MacGruber, we've got 10 seconds. Okay. Oh, but like, okay. So yeah, it, it definitely was a MacGyver parody very directly in okay. the original sketches. Yeah. And all the right, sketches were right. like 90 seconds long, right? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. You're right about that. I'm not enough of an SNL head to remember that it was based off uh, MacGyver initially. But yeah, I guess they just, uh, I mean, I, I love this whole sequence with Skinner. It makes me laugh every time. I especially love, which I forgot, that it's a callback to the beginning of the episode where he is, because when you first watch it, you're like, oh, maybe Skinner's just like coming up with something almost maybe even mean spiritedly to tell Bart to do. But no, he really does love the idea of whenever you're in a tough spot, make a game out of it and see if you can get your score higher every time. <laughs> and I, I totally forgot it was a callback to the beginning of the episode. It makes it even better. I love his little look at Bart when he says that like, eh, see? <laughs> yes, he looks right at him like, see, I wasn't just fucking with you. That's a good thing to do. And Bart rolls his eyes like, oh, God. Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I love when he ends with, that's my courageous story story yes yeah and everybody <laughs> yeah. applauds like god i yeah. uh i'll yeah i i just love too that they're tearing apart his home over and over again like uh, skinner says they go there more than once and they never yeah. look in the garage the, like the, the drinking of his beer and uh, eating of his food is really nice too uh, i'm in here well let's go <laughs> oh god yeah. it's it's also good but again this is so wacky town like one the mafia has to act in a way that they've never acted the whole rest of the episode of like hey oh don't need to yell and then they have to uh, the police have to be so stupid that they have missed him in his own garage for two <laughs> weeks like it's which is perfect like uh though yep. you know they're not talking about if this was a season 12 joke or 13 they would talk about skinner um having to relieve himself while under that pile of newspapers as well there, Absolutely. Would, there would be something yeah. scatological in there but uh, but yep. yes the again another of my favorite like one word lines ever in Simpsons in this next quick clip. I formed a crude rocket from a discarded cigar tube and remembering an experiment from my days as a fourth grade science teacher <laughs> I concocted a fuel from baking soda and the juice of discarded lemon wedges the rocket took off with a mighty blast of carbon dioxide dragging behind it the end of a vacuum cleaner cord I grabbed onto the vacuum cleaner pushed the cord retractor button and was on my way to freedom that's my courageous story. <laughs> Your Honor, if the prosecution moves, Principal Skinner's testimony be stricken from the record. Denied! Casey Smith! Your Honor, uh, do I still get paid? <laughs> what a gambit from, what, the district attorney? Yes, but let's yeah. just forget that this yeah. man is alive. How about uh, that? Uh, you know, it works sometimes in the Law & Order show. Characters will say that. That's, it? that's yeah. the same attorney from uh, Krusty Gets Busted. It's like, yeah. it's the one with the B on it. You're right, yeah. It, he, he must be he must be the boss and blue-haired lawyer just works for him in this, in this case. But, man, I just... The way Judge... Uh, well, later he'll be called Judge Schneider just goes, Denied! Like, just <laughs> I, so good. I love that, too. I have that in... in in my little one page of notes here i just just the word denied in all caps it's so great uh and then uh they come to what i think in a season two episode would just be the ending which works perfectly fine of like bart says uh the very like you know obvious moral to the story crime doesn't pay and then he sees that actually it pays very well for these mobsters and they completely undercut the moral that would work great as a season two ending but they need a little something extra for for this season three now again this is them leveling up but just i I also really love the pacing of when Fat Tony says, yeah, you're right. And he gets in his uh, limousine, Legs and Louie walk off screen, and then the two limos <laughs> drive past. Like, that's so good. And on his limousine, there's a bumper sticker saying Mafia Staff Car. If we go back to Treehouse of 401, yeah. Homer's wearing Mafia Staff Apron. Apparently, that kind of merch was popular around the time Godfather 3 came out. It's crazy. Mm -hmm. I had no clue. Like, did, the did, Mafia did, Staff themed, like, bumper sticker or, like, shirt or whatever. Was Paramount just give it PR department just giving that out for free to, to the comedy writers back then? I, I feel like they were just, these are all just bootlegs. Like, oh. hey, you like Mafia stuff? Well, here's... Well, we got Ninja Turtle Bart, but here's... Here's Mafia Staff uh, T-shirt. Ninja Turtle Bart if, for you if kids. They, if they cut the um, Bart getting splashed sequential gag to make room for the limos sequential gag, I guess, I, I guess I'm glad they did. And even a good trade. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's a similar joke, and it, it made me laugh that I, I was expecting the scene to be over. Like you said, and you're like, there's another limo, and they're all riding limos. Every single member of the crew has a giant limo. But then comes a perfect fourth wall shattering ending, which also works great. And uh, it is the Gene and Reese special for the critic as well. Like, this is pretty much a scene for the critic, and I mean that as a compliment. And also, like, Rich Moore was the series director on the critic, and he's the director of this episode. But uh, let's have one final clip here of blood on the blackboard 
Blood on the Blackboard, <laughs> the Bart Simpson story. Starring Richard Chamberlain as Principal Skinner, Joe Mantegna as Fat Tony, Jean Seymour as the woman he loved, and TV's Doogie Hauser, <laughs> Neil Patrick Harris as Bart Simpson. Bart, I'm scared. Let's get out of here. Shut up! Where do you want it, Skinner? <laughs> Not smart. Cool! Hey, when do we get to check for this? Well, they said they changed it just enough so they don't have to pay us. Oh, you know who the real crooks are. Those sleazy Hollywood producers. <laughs> Frank Carbone vindicated. Yep. Yeah. That yeah. Last joke. That's exactly his problem. I was thinking of that after I looked up the history of him suing the show. It's like I, maybe he saw the end of this episode and he was like, you know what? Homer's right. Yeah. I got oh my God. Do. They admit it. <laughs> he admit I, it. I like how like in the writing of this promo within the universe, uh, they realize like Neil Patrick Harris is stunt casting. So they have to say TV's Doogie Hauser. Like, yeah. oh, don't you want to yeah. see him play a bad boy? Oh, so good. And that's I also like how the the, the Shearer voice is very drama, um, you know, um, crime story. Story, but then for Doogie Hauser, he gets a little bit more. He, he kind of like hurt a little bit when he says Doogie Hauser. It's more fun, and then he goes back into crime voice. Yeah. Woman he loves, and Doogie Hauser. Yeah, yeah. Just the, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah. I, if, if, if you like, if you would have asked me, was Neil Patrick Harris ever on The Simpsons? I would have said no because I always forget the episode ends with this. Yeah, yeah. It, I'm still shocked with Neil Patrick Harris, who has been a constant in our lives, like pretty much famous. I'm uh, our entire lives. I mean, there was like a low point of like, oh, he's. he's famous and then he's a little less famous and then he came, comes back and it's you know he's the internet's own neil patrick harris but mm. he's in all that time never again on the simpsons i was sure if i looked it up i'd be like oh in season 28 he came in and did not he's never been on the show since then which is crazy to me and my opinion on mph is yes i think he's a bit extra He's a bit of an online liberal celebrity, but I like him in stuff. I really liked him in Matrix Resurrections. Like he's, I love that the, uh, one of the most evil things uh, to Lana Wachowski is a sellout cis uh, homosexual white man. Like that's so great to me. I love that. But, uh, but yeah, he's, he would have been 17 or 18 at the time he recorded this. Uh, and ironically enough, six months after this aired, he would be the lead in Capital Critters, the uh, the Simpsons oh. ripoff show. Yep. Oh, you reminded me of Capital wow. Critters, Henry. Yeah. We did an episode about that for our other podcast. It was one of the most oh, painful God. things we've ever covered. Yeah. Uh, lo- I've never even like glanced at, at, at Capital Critters. It's all on YouTube and it sucks, but you can watch it. Uh, it's uh, Yeah, it's, look up our What a Cartoon on Capital Critters, especially if you're a Simpsons fan. I think you'll learn a lot about how it only exists because of The Simpsons and Stephen Bochco thought it would be easy to copy The Simpsons and make, and you know, he got a bunch of money I'm sure, but uh, and yeah, Joe Montaigne playing himself, that's great. I also think yep. Richard Chamberlain for 1991, that's great casting for, for Seymour oh, yeah. Skinner. Perfect. Perfect. It's, it's also um it, it's it's something I'll never quite get and even listening to the commentary why is it okay you know that there was concern over Bart joining gang why was it okay for a popular you know young person on TV to then cap someone five times in a row with a gun like okay they don't show the literal corpse you know get riddled with bullets but <laughs> they did show that earlier on itchy and scratchy but like it, it's just funny to me like where these lines were and why certain things were were permissible i also love the design of neil patrick harris wearing bart's costume and his hair is up in the bart <laughs> yeah. points like it's uh, yeah. it's a great character model for him too yeah all reenactments in in in, in that, that that eight season run are great I, you know the one in homer batman is actually one of my favorites that we mentioned earlier with yeah it's a living being. I don't care. It's just one of my favorite lines. With uh, a man in the so White House. I miss the era of... The, Not likely. <laughs> like uh, a provocative title, The Blank Story. So yeah. Homer's was Portrait of a Nass Grabber. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yes. Yes. It's too bad. You know, the TV movie world, it's different now. You know, it's uh, the rip from the headline stuff. Well, I guess technically, like, there's just about to be that Elizabeth Holmes movie thing. So these things yeah. do happen, but it's not the speed isn't as much. Like, it's usually about and, 10 years. Yeah. And they're not as trashy and fun. Like, that one looks very pristinely made and all that. Like, the, uh, I was just thinking the last era of that where there were jokes to do about it. It reminds me of Arrested Development in the early 2000s with the Tobias 
methinks an attic I shall seek. Right, uh, right. <laughs> you know, uh, r- running dramatization. Also a perfect uh, parody of the of Fox programming, especially. Like, both both took yes. great swings at Fox. The one yeah, I can, yeah, yeah, you're right. Yeah. The one I can think of that's similar to this, but they, you're right. They, uh, they have, like, a prestige TV sheen to them now, but there, there's the recent one about Joe Exotic, which I heard yeah. is okay. Yeah, that one. And there, uh, there's, like, a Pam and Tommy one. They're still kind of doing these for... Uh, they do yeah. have. Yeah. Well, yeah, yeah, but that's like looking uh, looking back, though. Yeah, like t- Pam and Tommy. You know, yeah, I guess the, I guess the happened. the Joe Exotic one is pretty as much more recent. Yeah, yeah. Though I think with all of those, and same with the Elizabeth Holmes one. Another thing that makes it different from the, this era of these true Hollywood story type deals is that they wait for like a documentary. Like there's a seven hour documentary yeah. first, and then once they're like, well, most people know the documentary, yep. so then we can do the shortened version of it in a dramatization. This yes. and, and that gives you more perspective and like you know if you do it instantly you're like well what do we read in the headline okay let's just <laughs> you know what did we hear instantly that happened to joey buttafuoco okay great then let's just make the movie on it right now the long island lolita that was, <laughs> that was the uh <laughs> that was the uh the OJ um fx show model when absolutely the espn documentary came up first and by the way i love that american crime story season because it is trashy and full of kind of slightly past their prime celebrities ryan murphy slightly. knows what he's doing with that stuff oh yeah definitely yeah. and that's definitely. the last time you'll yeah. ever I see don't... cuba Gooding jr again <laughs> yeah yeah well i well i talked about him for other reasons why he hasn't been around so much at the top of the show yeah exactly. <laughs> but yeah i mean nothing but great things to say about this episode oh like, yeah this is this is the show getting itself like this is them i i felt it a ton in mr lisa goes to washington even more in this like this is just them going like this is a show now we we're free of having to have like a moral lesson at the end or like a big hug we can just and we can parody tv shows and movies all we want the animation is perfect like homer and everybody's becoming themselves and they're understanding the wide swath of springfieldians they can put in the series like this is Mm -hmm. just so good and i I always forget it's at the beginning of season three in my mind it's like well no they figure things out more towards the end but no it's like from the very beginning of season three the show is becoming what we love yeah uh so much it was the first in the production run as well wasn't it uh second Second. only second Second. wow yeah Yeah. okay yeah so which means that they you know they hit the ground running but yeah i I couldn't agree more with you henry and um it, it like we said during this episode it it surprised me how many from hearing from you guys how many things were just returning for the first time like willie and uh, the the kind of higher definition we get on certain characters but it, it was it was great to to go back and see as also a joe montagna fan the first fat tony episode <laughs> i wouldn't have guessed this was his first either and the the only one he'd be in for several seasons as well um so yeah i was i was very happy to come back to specifically talk about this episode. Thanks. Yeah, thanks for joining us, Brendan, for another very long episode. We're glad you enjoyed this one. Uh, please let us know where to find you online and more about your podcast, Blowback, and perhaps uh, when it will return. Yes, of course. Um, you can find me sometimes on Twitter at, at deep underscore beige. Uh, you can also just follow um, at Blowback Pod. Is it Blowback Podcast or Blowback Pod? I don't know. Just You'll figure it out. <laughs> but uh, we have our season three coming this summer. Um, I'm going to say, I'm going to keep give us a little little uh, wiggle room and say this summer, uh, definitely. Think in, think in July. Awesome. And it will be about the Korean War. If people don't know, our first two seasons are available everywhere. The first season is about the Iraq War, and the second season is about the War on Cuba. Uh, specifically back in the 60s we've got you know it's a it's a narrative show but we have bonus episodes with interviews we have some cameos from performers and funny people that you might like as well and uh, we're excited to be going into this third season so, so thanks for give me a chance to to shamelessly plug it no yeah blowback is is great me and bob love it you guys do such great like history stuff and then on top of that the the side episodes uh, you know that are range from you know deep investigative like interviews with with other reporters or people on the ground in mm-hmm. situations or then just fun stuff with bill corbett or other comedians and just like goofing on movies you know it, it runs the gamut and i i love that about it well we love doing it and i don't know how we're how we found this this little corner to do it in but um it's 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 very nice and uh you know we're, we're just trying to make sure we don't screw it up um <laughs> this season will be this season will be good though i'm pretty sure so thanks again awesome yeah. can't wait to hear it hey your third season
season could be as good as the Simpsons yeah. third season. You know? <laughs> That's right. This was a good third season of something. Yeah, exactly. They really figured you out know? Brendan in the third season of Blowback. <laughs> we 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 really figured out the uh, the, uh, the capital flight to uh, <laughs> the colonial territories and really just made it the funniest character. You know, finally at that point. <laughs> uh, but but thank you so yes. much, Brendan. Thank you, Brendan. Of course, anytime. Thanks so much to Brendan James for being on the show. Please check out Blowback, an amazing podcast that we love. But as for us, if you want to check out more of what we do and get all these podcasts one week at a time and ad free, please go to patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. Sign up for five bucks a month. You get just that, but also everything behind the five dollar paywall. That's over a hundred bonus podcasts, but you also get access to monthly episodes of Talking of the Hill and Talking Futurama, our regular Patreon exclusive monthly mini series. That's all happening behind the five dollar paywall at patreon.com slash talking Simpsons. And there is a ten dollar level as well. When you sign up for that, you get all the five dollar stuff, of course but also access to one huge, immensely long podcast once a month, only for patrons of that level or higher. And what is that, Henry? Bob is talking about the what? A cartoon movie podcast, where we do a deep dive into an animated feature film, just like we do on The Simpsons each month, often for over five hours long at this point. Uh, We have covered recently, in April, we did Roger Rabbit. Who framed Roger Rabbit? A classic that we have long feared doing because it's just so full of history but we uh, did a great job with that i am assuming also uh, we before that did the disney golden age classic pinocchio and there's a giant back catalog of them including also this year south park bigger longer and uncut which we had a ton of fun talking about all of that over three years worth of what a cartoon movies i'd say over 230 hours of podcasts at this point are available to you at that ten dollar level in addition to all the five dollar things bob mentioned it's a big special pre a podcast we do once a month that is totally worth your money i dare say check it all out at patreon.com slash talking simpsons so as for me i've been one of your hosts bob Mackey. you can find me on twitter as bob servo and my other podcast by the way is retronauts that's a classic gaming podcast all about old video games you can find that wherever you find podcasts or go to patreon.com slash retronauts sign up there for two full-length bonus episodes every month and henry what about you follow me on twitter at h-e-n-e-r-e-y-g i'm always tweeting up a storm there and also follow the official twitter account of this podcast at talk simpsons pod 